Okay, welcome everyone to ANC 34G's regular uh, meeting. This is the second, the fourth Monday in September, and that's when we regularly meet on the second and fourth Mondays. I will just note that uh, we will not be meeting on October the um, 11th, 11. which is Indigenous Peoples Day, and it is a district holiday, and typically we do not meet on district holidays. Um, so unless something urgently comes up, we're not going to meet again until October 25th. Um, I'm Randy Speck. I'm the chair of ANC 34G, and I represent the single member district that's ANC 34G03, and that's basically the area between Nebraska and Utah and uh, Broad Branch. Uh, and we'll introduce all of the other commissioners. I'll begin with uh, John. You want to introduce yourself? I'm John Higgins. I am ANC commissioner for uh, District 2. Basically, that is from uh, Oregon on the east to Utah on the west and from uh, Military Road on the south to close to Wise Road on the north. Peter? Uh, I'm uh, Peter Gosselin. Uh, I represent District 6, which is the neighborhood from the Western Avenue border uh, with Maryland from 41st Street to the Chevy Chase Circle, then south to military along the entire west side of Connecticut, back to 41st, and uh, military, uh, uh, Connecticut to uh, 41st, and then a peninsula to the east, uh, Kanawha to Legation, uh, bordered on the east by uh, Chevy Chase Parkway. Honey? Hello, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Connie Chang and I am the single member district commissioner for 05, which is the east side of Connecticut starting at Legation. So it covers the Chevy Chase uh, Public Library and the Community Center, uh, going up to the Circle on Western, hooking around to Broad Branch Road on the west side, and then down um, uh, to Legation basically. And then there's a little tail. Uh, that is um, that goes down to Jocelyn uh, between Chevy Chase Parkway and Nevada Avenue. So nice to be here. Lisa. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Gore and I'm the commissioner for ANC 34G01, which represents um, all of Hawthorne and portions of Barnaby Wood. And I cover from uh, Western, so from Oregon to Western, past Pinehurst Circle, down a little bit of Tennyson, um beach street and back up to oregon <laughs> chris hi i'm uh i represent district seven chris frombaluti happy to be here again uh military road on the north nevada on the east nebraska on the south and reno on the west and there are a few little uh areas that uh Connie and Peter mentioned that I don't have in that little section and I won't get involved in that. It's very complicated over there. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Michael. Yeah, I'm 3GO4, which includes Lafayette Elementary School and is bounded on one side by Morrison, the other on Tennyson. And it goes from Broad Branch to Utah um, with little carve outs in between. Great, uh, we've got all seven commissioners here, so we have a quorum and can conduct business. Um, I'll first introduce the procedures that we're gonna follow tonight, and then we'll talk about the agenda, and then we'll go right into the agenda at that point. Um, a, a few words about the, the procedure. We're obviously on a virtual platform again, as we have been for some time. Uh, we expect to continue to be virtu meet virtually probably through the end of the year at least. Um, we really want to have as much community participation in these meetings as we can. I see that we now have uh, about 60 uh, participants who are attending, which is a very good turnout for tonight. Uh, I know that a lot of you are here to hear about the Murray plans at the Episcopal School, and we'll get to those uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, for the, this part of the meeting and uh, uh, as we go through it, the commissioners will have audio and video, and uh, they will be recognized uh, as panelists and can speak. When we get to presentations or when we get to a point where we have questions or, or comments from uh, the attendees, 
uh, you will be made a panelist and Lisa Gore is going to elevate you then to a, to a panelist. So we will have audio and video as well. Uh, we wanna make sure that everyone is identified and we can understand who you are. So if you, you're named on the attendee list does not match your actual name, please change it and so that we can recognize who you are. Also, if uh, you want to be recognized when we get to that point in the, in the meeting, we'll ask you to please raise your hand. So if you use the raise hand function. We also have the Q&A function operable as well as the chat. And if you have any comments you want to make that are just purely comments, uh, please put them in the chat. If you have questions that you would like to have answered, you can put them in the Q&A. And we will keep uh, copies of the Q&A and of the chat so that we can know exactly what's going on during the meeting. Um, there may be so many speakers that we, especially when we get to the discussion with the Murray proposal, uh, if there are a lot of speakers that need to be need to want to be heard, and we don't have time to hear everyone uh, talk as long as they would like, we may have to put in a time limitation. And if so, we'll let you know then and what the time limitation will be. Uh, we just want to make sure that everyone has an, uh, an equal opportunity to be able to speak and rather than just one person taking up a lot of the time. Uh, our meetings are recorded, and so they will be posted on our website uh, probably tomorrow morning. Um, if there are any questions that we can't get to tonight, then we will, uh, as I said, take copies of the questions and we'll uh, uh, try to prepare answers to those or have Murray may prepare some of the answers to those. And then we will post those uh, on our website as well. Okay, with that introduction, uh, let me go to the agenda. The agenda we have is, has been posted on our website and on various listservs and on Nextdoor. Uh, are there any modifications or changes anyone has to the agenda? Okay, all those in favor of adopting the agenda, please raise your hand. Seven zero. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, the first agenda item is commissioner's announcements, and I have a few. Um, the first is with regard to the Bingham Drive reconstruction. Uh, you may recall that this um, road from Oregon Avenue over to Beach Drive has been in terrible condition, has been closed for years now as a result of some work that DC Water did there. And it's DC Water's responsibility to rehabilitate and reconstruct the road. Uh, I periodically ask uh, DC Water and the National Park Service uh, what the status of this is because it's been uh, far too long in getting this road um, reconstructed. On September 19th, uh, the Park Service provided an update to the status uh, of Bingham Drive and due to a recent court case, they said, DOEE and the US Army Corps of Engineers have to complete an additional plan review for Bingham Drive. And I think this relates to the stream that runs near the, the road more than the, the road itself. The Park Service is planning to segment the project so that the restoration of the road can take place while these additional reviews are being conducted. Um, the Park Service has sent the permit uh, for the reconstruction to DC Water which is responsible for the work and is, and is currently under DC Water's review. Once the permit is signed, it becomes, comes back to the National Park Service for authorization by the superintendent. And once the superintendent signs the permit, it's in force and DC Water can begin work. And we've always hoped that this, that would be this fall because they can't work during the winter because they can't get asphalt. Uh, asphalt plants close down during the winter. So, I'm, I'm not sure we're gonna get anything done um, before the winter comes, but, and it's a, another real disappointment because this has happened year after year. Uh, the commission has requested a status report from DC Water, but as yet I haven't heard anything from them. Uh, the National Park Service says that regardless of the outcome of the Beach Drive management plan, that's the possibility of closing uh, Beach Drive for, for all or part of the time, uh, they are still intending to uh, reconstruct Beach Bingham Drive as a roadway. And so it, they're not gonna change those plans uh, depending on whatever happens with regard to Beach Drive. 
Okay, the next uh, announcement I have is with regard to uh, Carnegie Institute for Science. Uh, as many of you know, Carnegie is um, in our neighborhood. Uh, that Their campus is located on Broad Branch Road and they are having the first of their fall neighborhood lectures uh, tomorrow night uh, at 6.30. And these, these lectures are really quite good. They're the scientists who work at Carnegie who uh, prepare lectures about all kinds of topics uh, that would be of interest to a lay person. Uh, and uh, they have quite a good turnout when we were doing them in person and they're now doing them virtually. But uh, tomorrow night's topic is how to change the freezing point of water and other curiosities between the anvils. Um, and there's more information uh, about that and a link to register for the lecture is available on Carnegie's website. Um, next, the uh, ticket amnesty program that the district has been uh, uh, has offered uh, since last spring uh, has been extended. Uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles has extended from September 30th, was a, the original deadline, and it's now going to be December 31st. And since that program was launched in June, more than 32,000 drivers have participated in the program, collectively settling $44 million worth of tickets. Uh, now the district and uh, non-district drivers have until the end of the year to take advantage of the district's amnesty program that provides the opportunity to pay without a doubling of the penalty, any outstanding tickets for parking, photo enforcement, and minor moving violations. And there's more information available on the Department of Motor Vehicles website. Uh, finally, uh, yard waste collection is beginning for the fall. It extends from August 16th through October 31st. Uh, yard waste will only be collected in paper bags and DPW will collect up to 20 paper bags uh, for each yard uh, at the place where the trash and recycling are normally collected. And residents must call 311 to make an appointment for yard waste collection, or you can visit um, uh, 311.dc.gov or uh, use the 311 mobile app. Okay, any other commissioners have announcements? Connie? Hi, um, I just wanted to make sure that those who did receive a vaccination on September 18th at Chevy Chase Day in the community center, um, D Department of Health will return on October 9th to provide those vaccinations, the second shot, um, and they will uh, situate themselves outside of the center, um, they think. They'll put up, a, I guess, a tent and a place. Um, but they are also considering, um, though they don't give it now, booster shots. So um, we'll know, I guess, in another week or two, whether or not they will do that um, and they, if they will provide that. And if they do, then we'll try to post that on our website and, and other social media. So I wanted to mention that. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention um, is that DC is getting a new area code and that if we want to make any local calls starting on October 9th, we need to um, add in the plus one, so one, uh, 1202 starting October 9th. And just let me read a little bit about this new 771 area code. Um, apparently, 771 um, is going to start in the fall. And that area code uh, is uh, it lies between 770, which is the Atlanta suburbs, and 772, which is in East Central Florida. Um, and uh, any person who requests a new number um, can. Uh, our existing numbers will not change, but if you get a new number on or after November 9th, you may be assigned a phone number with the 771 area code. And you will need to dial one and that area code. Um, and that for long distance calls is long distance calls, but for local calls 202, it still remains local and uh, the price of the call will not change. But that will be, uh, I think, a big, a big change for, for DC people. Um, the other thing is uh, we have, uh, Commissioner Zeltin has spent some time in the farmer's market, but this past Saturday, uh, I showed up there um, along with Michael and Commissioner Gore was also there. And we expect to be there next Saturday as well, um, I guess weather pending, uh, to greet um, residents, constituents, and also to share what we know if you have questions and also to ask you to sign up for our email listserv so that announcements like um, 
important announcements like uh, meetings and so forth, um, you'll be able to get it through our email uh, lister. Um, and then one last thing is our information exchange series, which I will mention later, but I just want to put the date down now and I'll give the details, which is this Thursday, September 30th, starting at seven o'clock. It is posted on our website. Um, the second session uh, of the info, uh, info exchange series, which is really community outreach for the Chevy Chase Small Area Plan. Um, the topic will be uh, perspectives of high-rise uh, residents. We have two speakers, perhaps a third, who will come and talk to us about their experience living in the apartment buildings and the condo buildings. So more information is provided on our website. I could also provide the link on the chat. The first session went very well. Um, Commissioner Gosselin moderated that session, and that was on uh, small area plans uh, in general, sort of best practices uh, from um, an expert in Alexandria, Virginia. And that link to that video recording and so forth is on our website, but we'll talk about it more. But I wanted to say it now, just in case anyone left uh, before we did. Thank you. Michael? I just want to clarify one thing, Connie, with you, that once 771 becomes an area code, if I want to call you from my 202 number, I don't have to dial 1202. I just dial 202. No, uh, starting October 9th, you have to you have to dial one first. That's a new thing. I thought it was just from the notice I got from Verizon. It just said you have to dial the area code. Um, Other people are saying no, but I just got wind uh, on a well. You know, let's just test it out. You know, if we uh -huh. if we don't press one, it isn't going to go through. Um, if we dial, if we just dial the two hundred two number and it goes through, then we're fine. But I, I, um, I think that's right. I got I think the one. one. Yeah, yeah, I think one is a country code, but um, doesn't matter. Yeah. And then I should, I guess we should remind everybody to watch the Seinfeld episode where they were putting in a new area code in New York City. <laughs> right. And, uh, <laughs> okay. There's a lot of articles if you Google it, people who um, are a little bit aghast that we're not going to have a 202 area code. And they were asking like Congress uh, um, representatives to like give up their 202 numbers for the people who live here because, you know, we're really D DC residents and so forth. So it's been it's been uh, making the rounds. Yes. And Thank and you, one Michael. Other thing, one other thing, Connie, uh, to your notice to the community that we're trying on the ANC to create a mailing list, an email mailing list so that we can have direct communications with you and that you can know who your single member district uh, representative and our email and reach out. So we've got almost 80 people on the call. So if people would just send, if they're interested in being opting into being on this mailing list, if they would just send to the ANC um, uh, email, their name, address, and email, then we can um, get perhaps 80 people on that list. And that way we can communicate with you more directly and you can communicate with us about the things that are on your mind. That's all I have, Randy. Okay. Lisa? Um, I would incur, um, just piggybacking off of what Michael said, maybe Stephanie can put in the chat, the ANC office email address or somebody do that so that everybody will have that information. Okay. All right, any other commissioner announcements? All right, I know we have one um, community announcement, Lois Holland, uh, if you could raise your hand, uh, Lisa will um, give you audio and video so that you can make your announcement. And anyone else who wishes to make a community announcement, um, you could raise your hand as well. I just promoted Lois, and then it looks like we have two others after that. Yeah, Amir and Alex. Yep. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Speck. So I represent the Georgetown Reservoir Association that is very far south and west in Ward 3. In fact, we used to be Ward 2 until they switched us uh, going back a few years. Uh, my community wraps right around the Georgetown Day School or the former Georgetown Day School. And uh, we fully support that school being used as a public school. 
Um, we've had a couple of long meetings with Councilperson Che. She's been very generous with her time to talk about the future of this school. She has announced, and I'm visiting the ANCs, especially out in your area and further east, to make sure you understand this. She has announced that the chancellor is going to make a decision about whether to use this location as a high school. Our position is that a lower level school is great, even though there's a lot of traffic problems, but for the use of, of GDS as a high school would not be optimal. And I can rattle off uh, some data uh, that that uh, will sort of bring that home. Anacostia has nine transportation lines, Banneker 12, Cordoza 20, Columbia 16, Duke Ellington 9, McKinley 8, Roosevelt 10, Woodrow Wilson 17, the MacArthur School has one bus and WMATA is ready to take that bus away. So our position is that this would not be good for students, uh, for teachers, for parents, because high school students generally need to be more independent. They come home at later hours, uh, everything that I think you understand. So what, what, I what I'm going to do is ask you um, if you might consider issuing a resolution saying that you prefer a more centrally located high school. And I think it needs to be far east. Uh, these Western schools are very difficult for kids, especially those coming from Ward 4, and many of them do, um, that you would issue a resolution supporting a more central location, a location that's on uh, some uh, a metro stop or something very uh, much more accessible and or I will be writing a letter to the chancellor um, and I'm going to recommend that you somehow join me in doing that uh, and, and lend your support to, to the idea of a centrally located high school. Okay, thank, thank you, Lois. This is a, uh, an issue that's obviously important for all of us in this area, but uh, gonna take a lot more uh, study and uh, discussion, I think, of the commission. Okay, well, thank you very much. Any commissioners have any questions or comments? What's the, what's the timeline for this chancellor's decision? Nobody really knows um, uh, because I think he's kind of stumped, but I would assume he's got to make it by the end of the year. So I'm going to put my information in the chat uh, so that uh, you have my contact information and I'd be happy to set up a, a, another meeting so that we can discuss uh, what to do about this. Okay. Does my, my that help? Were, my kids were lifers at GDS. I know that campus very well, and I agree. I agree with you. Yeah, Mary Che, when we had a meeting, threw her hands up in the air, and she said, "That was terrible driving down there every day." So I'll leave you with that. Uh, but thank you very much for the opportunity to speak okay. with you. All right, uh, Lisa, you want to promote? Emir or Alex or both? Hello, hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes, and I'm Amir, to do to it, to, but this lighting yeah. isn't collaborating. Could, could right. we ask you to please be as brief as you can because we've got a very busy schedule. Yeah, tonight. I'll be fast today. So good evening, everyone. My name is Amir Garabintab. I am the Ward 3 liaison from the mayor's office. I just have a quick few updates today, mostly concerning COVID. So as of last week, our COVID numbers uh, with the vaccine are about 67% of all DC residents have gotten the vaccine, at least one dose of the vaccine and 56% fully vaccinated. And to this end, Mayor Bowser has extended uh, vaccine mandates to all adults who are regularly in schools and child care centers in DC starting November 1st. So this applies very broadly to any school, any public school, private school, parochial school, child care center, um, charter school, and it applies to anyone who really works inside the school. So any teacher, any substitute teacher, guidance counselor, uh, coach, assistant to any of those principals, janitorial staff, 
uh, cafeteria staff, they must all get their vaccine by that date, November 1st, 2021. And uh, there is no testing uh, test out option, which is the option for those who are unvaccinated to receive weekly testing. So you have to receive your vaccine uh, if you can medically. And that also has been extended to student athletes who have to get it if they turn 12 between September 20th and November 1st, they have to be fully vaccinated by December 13th to participate in extracurricular activities. And um, there will be no more uh, testing for those as well. And schools are gonna be performing contract tracing by random testing of unvaccinated students every week. And that will be uploaded to the uh, coronavirus.dc.gov website every Wednesday. And on the topic of schools, uh, we also wanna stay on top of any infrastructure issues in schools because they were doing a um, building spree to fix any COVID issues. So we wanna make sure that all the schools in the area are running in tip top shape. So if you hear about any infrastructure issues, just report them to me. And uh, also there's been word of the third booster shot. Once DC approves that, and once it's fully approved, it's gonna be available anywhere where the vaccine already was available. Uh, keep in mind that it's only recommended for certain people, um, elderly people and people with immunocompromised or other health conditions. And I was gonna to get to the ticket amnesty, but Commissioner Speck beat me to that. So I just have one more thing. Um, as you know, as Mokers, we do community visits, we do walkthroughs. So if anyone, resident or commissioner has any uh, desire for a community walkthrough to report on any issues in their area, feel free to schedule that with me whenever because we are heading into the winter. And in the winter, the city kind of goes into hibernation as far as uh, repairs. So we wanna get those reported as soon as possible. And with that, I can leave my contact for anyone interested. Thank you. Lisa? Amir? Yes. Is there any possibility of reporting out separately the COVID testing numbers and um, for DC public schools? Separately, as far as like separate from coronavirus.dc.gov? Well, just in your update. So, like, oh, okay. you give us a percentage of how many adults are tested. I think right now, one of the major concerns out there is the numbers in the school. Right. Um, and our schools in Ward 3 might be doing okay, but across the city, there's a lot of issues. So I would personally like to see that broken out separately. Sure thing. Yeah, I can pull that data up and I can get that in our next meeting as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's on their website. It's publicly accessible and I can incorporate that into my reports as well. Oh, Thank I would appreciate that. it. Thank you. Okay, Alex. Can I just ask as Alex comes up, um, Amir very kindly uh, complied with the written text as of course you do, Randy. Um, Alex, I forgot to ask you in advance, please give me a uh, written text. It helps getting the minutes out faster. Yes, I will do that in the future and my apologies for not providing. Um, thank you everyone for your time. Uh, my name is Alex Kreffitz. I work with the Chevy Chase Main Street. I know there's a lot to discuss tonight, so I will get through my announcements as quickly as I can. There are four of them. Um, the first has to do with um, what was talked about several months ago, uh, a community message board. Uh, originally, the Main Street had come to uh, this group to discuss interest in installing a community message board somewhere along Connecticut Avenue in a place that's accessible, that would include space both for the ANC to provide public updates, as well as community updates and uh, opportunities and events from the businesses. Uh, the, that process um, stalled for a couple of months due to some uh, ongoing communication problems, but uh, graceful, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that Commissioner Chang has agreed to work with us to source a couple other properties. Uh, at this time, the community message board would have to proceed in one of two ways. One, it would require working with a private property owner that has land that is suitable for one to volunteer or another, in some other way provide that land to install a sign, or it would require working with the city to do the permitting to have it installed in public land, which along the corridor is mainly sidewalk. Um, so that would exponentially increase the cost of the project, but uh, we were prioritizing at this time trying to find a property owner to work with. Uh, we have identified one that we think can be the primary as well as a couple backups, and I'm hoping to have more information for this group uh, as that continues. The second thing I wanted to share was as DC begins its new fiscal year on October 1st, so too does the Chevy Chase Main Street. 
Uh, one of the most important ways that impacts our work is that it allows us to replenish and restart our small business grants. In the past, we've provided over $40,000 in small business grants to businesses along the corridor. Uh, right now, my interest and the Main Street's interest is prioritizing grant opportunities for businesses that are looking to either increase their accessibility, be it through ADA accessibility measures, ramps, uh, installation, staircase replacements, anything that helps people physically enter and make use of the businesses on the corridor, as well as uh, grants towards businesses that are looking to transfer to online point of sale systems, particularly businesses that previously did not have a web presence in order to be able to take orders online, as well as to sell gift cards and other things online in the preparation for the holiday shopping season so that businesses that previously might not have been able to engage in that space have the opportunity to do so in a time of year when everyone is shopping. I will have more information about those grants uh, in early to mid-October, and I will share with this group when those are available, as well as to our business owners directly. The third thing I wanted to mention was um, sort of a celebration that we actually have a couple of new businesses that are opening on the Main Street. Uh, these three are located within the Chevy Chase Arcade. The first is Anderson Weir Studio, which is a interior design firm that uh, previously operated without a studio space, but have now opened one in there to meet with clients. Uh, and the second two businesses that are opening within the arcade are Got Your Back Total Fitness, which is a combination healthcare, fitness, and exercise location that is actually moving to the Chevy Chase neighborhood from Spring Valley. And in the front of the Chevy Chase Arcade, in the previous space with Burt's Jewelers that has been unoccupied for several months now, uh, Juice Coffee House will be moving in there. Uh, Juice Coffee House is actually being owned and managed by the same group that is doing Got Your Back Total Fitness. Uh, the Main Street is in conversation with the owners of all of these businesses and hoping to learn more about how we can connect them with resources as well as their relevant ANC commissioner. Um, most of these businesses should be operating by October 1st, but of course, these things can be tricky with launches. So if you go by, please be sure to stop in and welcome our new businesses to the neighborhood. The last thing I wanted to share quickly was just a note about Halloween. Um, I know in the past there have been many celebrations on the Chevy Chase Main Street and throughout the corridor doing Halloween events for children with hundreds if not a thousand kids coming through. I know it's something that folks in the community really treasure and something that unfortunately could not happen last year due to COVID-19. Uh, my understanding is in the past child's play has played a pretty instrumental role in organizing these Halloween events. I have been in conversation with child's play to try and have an understanding about would it be sensible in a health perspective to have some type of event? And how can we do an event that would be healthy and safe for all who participate? At this time, we're still in early discussions and we really wanna prioritize the owners of Child's Play have reiterated time and time again that the health and safety of children is their number one priority. Should we reach a, an idea for an event that we think we can do safely and healthily, I plan to share it with this group and the community. Uh, but those are the announcements I have for today and thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you, Alex. Okay, uh, anything further from commissioners? All right, let's go quickly then to our agenda item on the report on the small area plan process. Peter? Randy John, John is here. Can I just say, could, could, given the number of people here, presumably from Array, I mean, I should have said this during the agenda, would it not be polite and make sense if we move that up? That, that's fine with me. I just, I, Connie, unless you want to, uh, unless you feel otherwise, I, I just worry about the number of people. Yeah, no, I love that idea. I was just going to say that John, uh, to, to, oh, John already, I just all of a sudden saw his uh, picture. It's okay. Never mind. I like that idea. I think we should do that okay. to be courteous to everyone who's on the call. Okay. All right, John, is that okay with you? Yes. You're running this portion. Um, oh, oh! But then someone said people might not all be on yet because yeah, they think it starts at seven fifty-five. Yeah, we did have it on this, the oh. agenda at seven fifty-five. So I think maybe we ought to let's just, just go. go. Right, yeah, let's right. just not go past seven fifty-five. Right. <laughs> okay. okay. Go, go ahead, Tani. You start. <laughs> okay. So, um, I, uh, I guess for the um, report on the small area plan process. We don't have dates yet from the Office of Planning for their uh, the next phase uh, right now. What we do know is that the vision and goals document is on their website for the Chevy Chase Small Area Plan. You could access it, and I will put it in the chat. You could access it by going to publicinput.com 
forward slash Chevy Chase. And that document is a yellow cover and there's six themes there. And they're asking for, um, they're open to feedback until I guess the deadline is October 8th. So you can uh, comment on each theme and say, do you think it's you know adequate? Is there anything missing? Um, the vision and goals will, that's like the sort of like your principles and your values will help us uh, decide on how as a community uh, on the sort of the 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 where you know the the more like uh, granular uh, for our neighborhood and so it is important for us to uh, read it review it and to provide input um, and while uh, we're waiting for when this design charrette when we'll have these conversations about visualization of 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 uh, the avenue we have uh, begun our information exchange, which uh, was a resolution passed in April 26. And um, yes, and we will, um, we've started with session one uh, that uh, occurred on September 22nd. That was last Wednesday. And it was very well attended. And uh, we have the video recording and the, and, uh, the link to that, as well as the uh, Q&A in the chat on our website. Um, I will also put that here on the chat. And the next session is coming this Thursday, September 30th, starting at 7. The Zoom details are all on our website, um, on the ANC website, as well as uh, posted to uh, various listservs. I'm going to do more today. Um, I think Jerry Mallett's Trevor Chase newsletter has it out, too. Um, please join. Um, it is a talk uh, with residents uh, from the apartments and condominiums because they are also a part of the small area plan, part of the neighborhood, and they will share their personal stories and and um, how long they've been here and what they think and any challenges that they face and what ideas they have for the avenue. So please come and join us there. Um, and I don't think I have anything else. If I can think of it, I will mention it. But Peter, I'm going to throw the ball to you and I might bring it back again. <laughs> If I can remember the next thing. Okay, uh, I uh, uh, all I would say is that uh, it's important that we people watch for the dates of this charade, um, uh, uh, because this is the first time we will see um, OP's ideas uh, 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 that they say will be drawn from the various interactions they've had with us. Um, uh, of, of, of what uh, the Chevy Chase uh, commercial corridor could look like in the future. Um, as we wait uh, for, um, for that event, um, I, I, I want to be sure that people notice that historic Chevy Chase DC, and I'm trying to find the announcement, um, is sponsoring a, a an event, I believe, on October 6th. That's right. Um, 7.30, starting at 7.30. 30, right. mm -hmm. um, to, to let um, Ward 3 Vision present uh, their uh, ideas about what a future Chevy Chase uh, should look like. Mm -hmm. uh, my hope, and I think a lot of hope, a lot of the people involved in this process it, it, from all sorts of positions is that uh, the arrival of pictures <laughs> will uh, give people a, a more um, a tactile sense of what we're talking about here or what we may be talking about. Um, um, so um, I'd ask residents uh, and interested parties to keep an eye out for the OP announcement and to look up this uh, um, Ward, Ward 3 Vision Historic Chevy Chase DC presentation on October uh, 6. I guess the only other thing I'd say is that um, uh, in the spring and through June, um, this commission did a lot of talking about a community forum. I think all of us on this commission, no matter what our position is, um, um, I'm, uh, I'm not sure what, how we could most effectively contribute to improving the planning process. Um, I have written uh, to uh, Erkin, uh, the project manager from OP for the small area plan, asking that we sort of reserve the resources uh, and extend the time that we might do a community forum. This, at least in my vision, is a town meeting-like event. Um, but uh, I, mean, I think it's really going to depend on how the community reacts to um, the, 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 the first pictures that kind of give us a real sense of what 
what we're talking about here. In any case, uh, and meanwhile, I guess on to one other thing that I hope that and this is addressed to my fellow commissioners, I do think that we're going to need to, organ, to organize in advance. And I wonder whether we, I just ask you to consider a subgroup, working group of commissioners to be prepared to comment on the draft proposal that ultimately emerges from the design charrette then that um, uh, OP puts forward as what should be our that small area plan for this area. Uh, and I hope that we, I think we're gonna need to organize that in advance because we're gonna need to do research to know how to intelligently comment, not a proposal for tonight. And with that, um, we are at uh, 7.40. I can turn it back to Connie or that's the end Look, of what I have to say. I, I was just gonna can only I, add- Can I make one oh, comment? Yes, Randy, please. Uh, mm -hmm with regard to the design charrettes as i understand that process it's not just op showing us their ideas it's rather an interaction between yes. uh the community people who will all come together and begin thinking together yes. Yes. about yes. What, what it would look like yes. uh, it's re really an opportunity for input from the community yes john right i have a niece who's an architect who's going through this business of charrettes so I asked her about it. She had just a, a, a brief comment. And I said, well, how formal are these things and so forth and how do they go? And she said, well, we prepared to see a lot of sticky notes that mm -hmm. people put up on a, on a whiteboard. So I don't know, just, just a little anecdote there. Well, I, said, I've been through some sh design charrettes for the uh, Lafayette Pointer Recreation Center. And it was a very useful process where it was very, uh, collaborative and um, everyone working together on on trying to come up with ideas and it was very useful so i would just say i just say that um for those who are netflix watchers i mean it, you know in the best of cases they can bridge incredible gulfs of dis disagreement between people there's a wonderful movie called best of enemies that at its center is a design, is not a design charrette is a charrette so, you know, uh, let, me, let me endorse it. It's a great movie to watch <laughs> and inspire. Right? That one lasted months, so. <laughs> gonna last months. I, I don't understand why ours can't, but okay. <laughs> okay, Connie? So, so the only thing I was going to add that I forgot was to say that, yes, this Thursday is the second session for the information exchange, but please mark your calendar for the Thursdays in October, the 7th, 14, and 21. Um, we're going to have uh, other panels, too, and hopefully bring nonprofit developers and community land trust experts and so forth um, so that we can gather together and just learn more so we can be prepared in this next uh, phase of the small area plan. And the commission is... Um, going to organize that and we'll give you more information as they come. Thank you so much. Thank you, Connie and Peter. Any other commissioners have questions? Okay, Lisa, you want to uh, address the um, Regional Social Equity Standing Committee report yep. on that? So let me start out by saying um, the last meeting we held, I had announced that we were going to meet on the 21st. And I want to apologize to the committee members because I completely forgot to send that link out. Thank you, Peter Gosselin. <laughs> <laughs> it was on my calendar. <laughs> Who texted me like almost at eight or seven? And I'm like, oh my gosh. So um, we're going to get back on track in October and have our next meeting with the regular schedule, which is the third Tuesday. So that will be October the 19th. And preliminarily on the agenda, um, the standing committee needs to vote, have a final vote on the mission statement. Uh, the last meeting we had, we had a pretty robust discussion on that, but we didn't come to an agreement on it. So there is a version out there um, that everyone on the committee has. I'll resend that out to committee members and hopefully we can get that voted on and finally approved. Um, also our priorities, which I believe Maurice was working on. And then um, another subgroup, Maria, Renee, and Cal were working on another set of objectives in terms of group participation. So at least those three things I wanna get on the agenda. My agenda item would be to update everyone on the second district disparate policing issue, which um, 
just a little bit about that. Uh, Robert White, Council Member White's office is still, as of I think last week, is trying to get a meeting with the Chief of Police. So we're still waiting on that. And if anyone else has um, anything they want to add to the agenda, I'm going to ask that everyone get that to me by the 8th of October so we can put it out to the community and the standing committee by the 12th. And that is where we are with that. Randy, you have anything to add? Nope, that sounds good. Okay, uh, well, we're gonna go ahead and start, I think on the Murray topic, we're 10 minutes early, but I think that's okay. There are now, uh, let's see, 90 people on the attendees list. And yeah. so uh, it's a very good turnout. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, okay, John, you're going to be taking us through this and then introducing the folks from Murray. Um, I'm not sure who is going to need to be on panelists, but certainly Stephanie Nash, um, who indicated a little earlier, and uh, uh, maybe Akash, can you uh, hey, raise your hand? All those who are going to be on. Yeah. Okay, John, you want to give us an introduction? Okay, very good. Um, I have a little script here, just so I hope I don't miss any miss anything. Um, and the Murray School announced in June that it had reached an agreement to lease the open space playing field behind the Episcopal Center at Utah and Nebraska Avenues. The Murray Board has been in dialogue with the ANC to provide background to the commission and to seek commission assistance in bringing this matter before local residents. The commission has scheduled this presentation to provide a forum to inform nearby residents of the plan and to provide both commissioners and residents an opportunity to speak to the Murray representatives. Later in the process, when zoning and DDOT permits are involved, the ANC will have an opportunity to vote on approval of those permits, which I believe will also involve public input. Thus, the ANC will not be voting on anything tonight. Murray will address the development timetable. Representing uh, Murray tonight is Akash Thakar, the uh, chair of the Murray board. He is a DC resident of this ANC and he will reduce he will introduce the other representatives as Stephanie Nash represents uh, the Episcopal Center. So I guess we can turn it over to Akash for his presentation. Um, uh, hello folks, uh, my name is Akash Thakar. Uh, I'm a trustee at the Murray School. I am not the board chair, uh, Sorry. but uh, I have so no, no, no problem at all. Thank you so much for the introduction, John. And thank you to the entire ANC for all the discussion you've had with us in preparation for this. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Marjo Talbot. Marjo Talbot, uh, as some of you know, is Murray's head of school, uh, and she can introduce our team. Uh, maybe even before I do that, I do see Stephanie uh, on the screen. Hi, Stephanie, and uh, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Stephanie Nash. I am the president and CEO here at the Episcopal Center for Children. And um, I'm happy to be a part of this call today and available um, for comments, questions uh, um, after the presentation of Murray. Thank you. So we're, we're um, Randy and Lisa, are you able to promote Marjo Talbot? Hang uh, on. If, okay. you, if everyone that is, uh, so I didn't have her name in advance. Marjo, if you can please raise your hand. Anyone that needs to be on this particular panel right now from ECC, please raise your hand so I could find you. Or from Murray. There we go. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Lisa. Makes it much easier. <laughs> okay. And is Trey going to be doing the screen sharing? Is should I? I, yeah. I should make him a, a co-host so he can do that. Please do. Okay. Okay, I think we got them all. Thanks everyone. All right. So oh, sorry, I was trying to get my video on. Um, are you ready, Randy, for us to yes. begin? Yes. 
First of all, thank you so much, commissioners, for allowing us to come tonight and talk about this exciting proposal. Um, as Akash said, I'm Marjo Talbot. I'm the head of Murray School. This is my 28th year. We are really excited to think about this potential partnership with ECC, but let me give you a little bit of background first about Murray. Murray is 110 years old, and we've been in the district for all of that time. We began in a small apartment founded by three Murray sisters from Gen um, Geneva, and then we moved to Calorama, and then 70 years ago to our present campus on the Woodley Estates. It was the Summer White House for three presidents. It was also the home of Secretary of State Simpson. As I said, we've been at the school now for um, and in our present location for over 70 years. Murray is um, presently on seven acres. We have 650 students, the majority of whom come from the district. We have always believed in true partnerships and being a community member. For example, every summer, our campus is given over to about 150 DCPS students um, in the Horizons program to ensure that they continue to grow and develop during the summer. The one deficit Maria has had over this time, and as I said, I've been there 28 years, is to extend our athletic facilities. We have one field in the back of the school. So we've had so many partnerships throughout the city, Taft in Northeast, Duke Ellington, UDC, Friendship, and about 10 years ago, helped develop the Jella Field, which had been an unusable space and now is a wonderful athletic facility for the city youth. We also have ensured that many people can use our fields, our um, gyms, because we know that there is a dearth of athletic facilities for the city youth. I want to turn it over the meat of this to Trey Holloway, who is our assistant head for finance and operations and has been working doggedly on this project for over a year. So Trey, please introduce yourself. Other people we have tonight are Liz Hall, who's our Director of Athletics, um, Akash and Vadim Nikitin, who are trustees, um, and anybody else in our team who can answer questions, we certainly will. Thank you, and to Trey. Thank you, Marjo. Um, as Marjo said, I'm Trey Holloway. I'm the Assistant Head of School for Finance and Operations at Murray. Um, I'm going to take you through our proposed development of the site on ECC tonight. Um, so Murray's partnership with the Episcopal Center for Children um, includes a long-term lease of up to 50 years for five acres, which is the um, open backfield there behind the school, as well as the media center. Um, the lease doesn't include any other property that's there on the ECC site. Um, that includes the 12 apostle trees that are at the kind of heart of the three remaining buildings. Those will remain under the ECC purview. And of course, our proposed development will take care not to disturb those trees. So I will jump directly now kind of into the picture here that's a conceptual site plan. I want to orient you quickly. Um, I will talk about the north, south, east and west um, of the property. So the north is at the top where um, the alley behind the house is on Rittenhouse. The west is going to be um, towards Utah, which is on the left-hand side, the south, Nebraska Avenue, and then the right, the, on the right-hand side, the east, 28th Street. So I'm going to move you up the property, moving from the south up to the north, and point out a few key things here. So starting on the south are um, bus laybys that are on Nebraska Avenue. I'll talk a little bit about those later on. Then we have new access onto the site, which is a curb cut that will go into a parking lot. So that parking lot is going to have approximately 50 um, parking spaces. As we move to the east, you will see a bioretention area to collect uh, stormwater. And then the first kind of part of the athletic fields, which is a combination um, kind of pitching warm up area and batting cage. Then you will see our baseball diamond there. 
And if I move to the bottom of the baseball diamond behind home plate, you will see dugouts and bleachers um, just to the right of home plate and to the left of home plate. And as I move up the left-hand line, we again have um, a bullpen and batting cage area. As I continue to move northward, there's a service yard that's there. Um, that service yard is intended to be for emergency access should there be an emergency vehicle that needs to get either to the field for um, a sports injury or to the field house for some type of delivery. And then the media center, which we've dubbed kind of the field house in our presentation here, um, will have some interior renovations to it. Um, we would like to have a training room for taping ankles, um, maybe a changing room for visiting teams, as well as um, some storage space is in the basement there that we would use. On the exterior of the building, we would also add a new entrance to the building that would face the fields. The current entrance is um, on the what would be the back of the building it, that does not face the fields. Then we have the multi-purpose field. You will see that it's 195 feet um, wide. And on the Western side, you will see a sloped area where we would potentially have some seating there. Continuing behind that seating is the tree relocation area. So I'll talk about trees in a little bit, but there will be some trees on the site that would need to be relocated. And that's um, an area where we would propose to put the trees. As I move along the Northern edge of this picture here, um, there's a scoreboard as well as um, a set of movable bleachers. It's a little small there, but there, um, as I continue to move eastward, um, there's a shed here at the top, which would be somewhere where we would store um, equipment that we would use there on the field. And then down at the south edge of the field, there's also another set of movable bleachers. Um, I do wanna be sure to point out that in the northeast corner and the southwest corner, there would be shot clocks, which are needed for lacrosse. Um, so those would be in addition to the scoreboard that would be in the middle of the north edge of the field there. Um, lastly, I wanna point out, there are several spots where we note landscape buffer as well as perimeter netting. So we will have a landscape buffer all around the property. So you can see that kind of on the south edge, the east, all along. And we would also have netting to protect um, obviously from balls flying out of the playing area that we would have here. And that landscape buffer, I wanna point out, would sit inside of the netting. And I'll have a picture of that for you later. So this is a 3D rendering of the site that kind of shows you the elements a little bit better. There are a few items that I do wanna point out, particularly here at the bottom at Nebraska Avenue is a gate. And so we do think we need to have a gate to control access so cars don't park there overnight or it becomes a sort of nighttime place. Um, the fly ball netting, again, as you can see up the left field line, as well as the far northern edge of the field. Um, that's what I, when I reference the netting, that's what I'm talking about. And again, you can see the landscape buffering that's in place around the edge and how that netting is inside of the landscaping to give a better view. Of course, the scoreboard here in the middle, and then to show you all the seating that's on the western edge here on that sloped area. Um, we will also have some temporary netting that would be in place for lacrosse games because of the seating here. We do need to protect those balls from going um, out of the playing field. So this is a picture of Murray's campus and the backfield that Marjo mentioned earlier. So as you can see, we have netting here to keep balls inside of our property line. And you can see the trees and other landscaping that are along the outside of it. So um, behind our campus here is Garfield Street. So from Garfield Street and for the neighbors, you can't really see this netting. Um, what you see are the trees. And you can see we've got um, trees along this edge, the, the sideline, as well as the end zone there large trees, some that have been there for a while and some that we planted so that um, the neighbors would not see the, the netting and the field there. So this is a real world example of kind of how we've dealt with that problem in the past. Um, next, I wanna talk about field usage and the proposed hours that we're thinking about. Um, 
so there's after school usage in the fall and the spring. And I want to define fall for you. So the fall um, is defined for us as the two weeks leading up to Labor Day, which is one set of use. And then it would be Labor Day um, pretty much up until Thanksgiving. So the last two weeks of August leading into Labor Day, we would have our preseason practices. Those would go from the morning about 8 a.m. until 2 p.m., Monday through Friday. And then once school starts after Labor Day, we would practice there in the afternoons from 2 or 2.30 until about 6 p.m. or dark. And that would be um, every weekday we would do that. We would also have an occasional game on Friday afternoons. And we would also have some occasional Saturday games as well. Those Saturday games would usually run um, in the afternoons in the fall time. In the winter, we don't expect to be using the field for Murray usage. Um, it's not, we have indoor sports in the winter and we would not expect to be there. In the spring, we would have um, roughly similar usage to the fall. We would have afternoon practices from when we get out of school around 2.30, 3 o'clock until about six o'clock um, or dark. And then we would also have some occasional Saturday games that would go, those would start sometimes in the morning and go until the afternoon. And then in the summer, we would not have any Murray programming needs for the field. So we really wanna point out that um, we see this as a priority usage for Murray athletic programming. Um, that's why we're doing this. So we have somewhere to um, practice and play our games. But we do expect that there could be other youth um, athletic organizations that could use this space. So there are some groups that um, we currently have relationships with that use our backfield at the school that we think um, would probably make use of the space. Those include um, DC Soccer Club, formerly known as Stoddard, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, as well as DC Dynasty Baseball. And so we think that those youth organizations are a good fit for this space. And in terms of those usages, um, because of the usage that we have as a school, we would expect that to be focused around Sundays um, on the weekends in the fall and the spring when we're using the field for our outdoor athletic programs. In the winter, there could be some outdoor or some afternoon usage um, after school. And in the summertime, um, we hope to be able to offer the space to summer camps that run camps for children and youth. Um, we do expect any use by groups that are not Murray to be coordinated with us um, and kind of be in line with what we think is an appropriate usage time that meets with how we would use the field. So traffic and parking considerations. Um, we've engaged a traffic consultant to help us think about traffic and parking on the site. And along with that consultant, we've had a, um, a couple of meetings with folks from the Department of Transportation to review our plans um, and get their feedback. They've given us kind of great feedback on, on what, we would, what we're looking at and proposing here. Um, as noted earlier, we're gonna have about 50 parking spaces. Um, our athletic contests, usually don't draw more than 50 or 60 spectators. Um, so of course the city is encouraging us to have adequate parking on the site, but also carefully balance the amount of paving that we do on the site um, to create that parking and to utilize street parking on Nebraska Avenue where it makes sense. So our traffic consultants are really helping us um, with assessing the amount of available street parking that's available on Nebraska. Um, to understand how that may be able to supplement our plans for creating parking on the site. And again, I mentioned the bus laybys. Those are important for a couple of reasons. One really is safety um, for dropping off and picking up um, the students that would be coming here to practice. Um, the other thing to have in, for the, those laybys is that we don't need to do additional paving to create a bus turnaround. So we see that kind of as a, as a win-win there. Um, we also would hope to add some bike racks on the property to encourage biking to the facility. So there are a couple of items that I wanna point out that are um, site management issues. So currently on the site, there's no stormwater management and we know um, that there are areas of the field that get water, retain water and, and flood and actually cause some issues for some neighbors of the property. Um, we're going to be managing water much better than it's done today with the field. Um, 
we would certainly um, install a drainage system that would handle water runoff and benefit the neighbors. We think it would be a, a pretty improved condition. Uh, the engineers that we're working with are looking at a preliminary stormwater plan to really improve um, what's happening with the water there on the site. Um, as for trees, anyone who's walked by the site knows that there are a lot of trees on the site. Um, we hired an arborist from Wetland Studies and Solutions to help us inventory all the trees on the site and assess the health of all the trees. Um, that information was all collected and presented to um, the city's team of arborists, and so including the chief arborist and the arborist for Ward 4, we've had a few walk-arounds on the site um, with them to review the trees and see which trees um, need to be transplanted and how trees can be left in place um, and to understand exactly what needs to be done. So to transplant trees, there is preparation work that would need to be done, and so um, root pruning, um, pruning of the trees, canopies, and so We've been working with our arborists um, to prepare a plan to um, prep the trees for a move and as well as preserving them. And that includes treatment and um, care for the trees after they have been transplanted. So a little bit about um, timeline, a um, little bit some next steps. So obviously we're here um, giving our initial presentation to the ANC. Um, our hope is to submit our plan to the BZA early next month, which would put us in line for a hearing um, with them in early 2022. We would also go before the Public Space Committee um, late this calendar year, potentially. And we expect to continue to have meetings with um, neighbors and interested parties there in the neighborhood. Um, a high level construction um, timeline would include soil movement and grading in Q2 or, or Q3 of 2022, tree relocation in Q3, um, starting the construction in Q1 of 2023, and then completing construction probably Q3 2023. Of course, as um, we get closer to any of these steps, we will be able to provide more detail about what is happening um, uh, within each one of those specific steps. But for now, that's kind of a high level of what we're expecting to do. So I'm gonna hand it back to Marjo here to talk a little bit about um, neighborhood outreach and communication, but that concludes the, the overview of our plans and some of our um, uh, next steps. So Marjo, I will hand it back to you. Thank you, um, Trey, and I see a lot of good questions in the chat. Um, just that we do and welcome coming to any groups, um, whether or not you live on Nebraska and having one-on-one -on -one conversations or group conversations. We know that um, we want to develop this in partnership with the neighborhood. I honestly believe that this can be an enhancement and using the property for youth um, Athletics is a really key element of this plan, not just Murray's use of it. So um, please let us know, either Trey or me, if um, you want to have some more one-to-one -one or group conversations. We know that we'll come back to the ANC, and we're looking forward to developing this in partnership. So Randy, why don't I leave it to you to ask us questions. Again, is Liz Hall on this? list yet. Um, she's the director of athletics and they know that she's somewhere in the participant group. If she could raise her hand, that would be helpful. I just right. promoted Liz. Um, does Will Liebner need to be promoted? Is he with you guys? No, I mean, Will's an alum who may have comments that he'd like to make or questions, but he's not part of the presentation. He's okay. a Okay, John, you want to organize the questions from commissioners? Uh, okay, I, I guess I'll, I'll start off. First, I'd like to thank some, uh, some residents who have commented and sent their comments to me. I want to assure those residents that all their questions will be forwarded to Murray at some point. Some of those questions have already been, been sent over to them. Uh, Jessica Cohen, I don't know if she's yeah, attending tonight. Claudia Russell, 
Kathy Arbrizetti, I don't think she's on the on the chat tonight, and Carol Zachary. So those are the people who have um, presented to me some very extensive questions, which definitely will be put in the hopper for Murray. Uh, just to highlight some of those questions, I don't have any personally, but I'll just quickly go through a couple myself, uh, which I think uh, were of significant concern. One was a, a question about getting details on the grading and the materials, and basically the, the civil engineering details. Uh, this person is, uh, has some expertise in this area. I, I think that's Claudia, and she wanted to know um, how, those, uh, how that information when it will be available and, and can it be accessed at some point. I presume that would come up with the uh, Board of Zoning, but maybe Akash can can address that. Sure, um, so again, Ak uh, can you all hear me? You've got some feedback, but we can hear you. Yep, uh, okay, uh, Akash Thakar, uh, again, uh, Murray, um, uh, Board Trustee, uh, just Quick background, I actually do live in your AMC over on Legation Street and graduated from uh, St. John's, so a long time uh, Chevy Chase uh, resident um, and prior to that uh, attended school there. Um, to answer Ms. Russell's question, um, you know, this is an introductory meeting and our plans are in their concept phase. Um, I wanna be uh, very clear with Ms. Russell that you know, we understand that there is a, a stormwater issue back behind her home and uh, we probably won't have detailed plans for another three to four months. I think, as you said, John, once we submit our Board of Zoning Adjustment plans, they will provide us comments on our concepts. And once we tweak the concepts with uh, ideas that the community may have, the city may have, then we go into what's called final engineering uh, over the next, I'd say, uh, you know, three to six months, at which point, to answer Ms. Russell's question, we will have detailed plans and she'll be the first to know we will share them with her and be happy to meet on site, as Marjo said, with her and others to walk through them. Uh, and as I've shared with her, um, uh, our sense of it, and I think she feels the same way, is that the situation from a stormwater perspective, because there's no stormwater management anywhere on the site today, um, will be greatly enhanced because we will be putting in stormwater management structures, um, uh, particularly close to her home, but frankly, all, all around the, uh, the property. And I do want to reiterate two points. One, we have on the Murray website that is open to everybody in a, under athletics, a place that says ECC um, athletic, proposed athletic complex. That has our most up-to-date information. We'll continue to update that with all of the information that we have. I also want to re-emphasize that there are no lights planned for play on those fields. We are hoping to have the gates open during the day if there are non moray events or DC soccer is not playing there or others. Certainly we wanna make sure that people can be there, but it is athletic fields. It will be artificially turfed. It's not the old rubber turf, it's the environmentally sound turf that um, we have now on our backfield, but we're absolutely happy to give that information out when anybody needs it. Okay, the, the second question I had, uh, I'm highlighting these questions because they, they struck me as, as of interest to, to the seven commissioners. So the next question would be a concern about disturbing the alley behind behind the field, which I guess is sort of a nice play area for the, for the kids in the neighborhood. And there was concern that that would be um, uh, disturbed during the uh, during the construction phase and perhaps uh, permanently. So, could you please address that? Uh, before you before you address that, can we take the can we take off the presentation so that we can see everyone's faces and so forth? Thank you. Sure. So, our construction plans um, do not call for any permanent you know standing changes to the alley. You know that's a that's a public access point. And so I think we would understand that we need to maintain that. Nothing that we have looked at in our planning for this has indicated that anything needs to be done to that alley to accommodate our plans. Um, you know, may there might there be some disruption from time to time, you know, potentially, but we have no plans for any permanent changes to that alley. Uh, would, would it wouldn't be it would not be disturbed during construction during construction either. Um, I mean, we have not 
even engaged a construction firm yet. So I don't want to full on commit to that. Um, could that potentially happen? Possibly, but definitely nothing permanent. And I think that we would know that we needed to work with the neighborhood exactly about the construction plan, you know, hours that people can expect to have construction on the site and not. We've done a lot of construction in um, our 3000 Cathedral and have worked really um, constructively with our neighbors to make sure that there's not um, undue noise or pressure on that. Okay. Um, let me go back to a question that Trey brought up real quick while we, before we forget it. You just said that there wouldn't be any permanent disruption to the alleyway. Are you talking strictly during a construction phase mm -hmm. or post construction? Are you anticipating any disruption to that alleyway or the use of the alleyway post construction? No. Okay. I wanted to address one one follow on and um, uh, an introduction. Paul Tummins is our land use council. Wave Paul, um, uh, and he's working with Maria on this proposal. Um, you know, he mentioned something important that as 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 ANCs often do with folks like us, we will put together a very comprehensive construction management plan, uh, which will detail when we can work, when we can't work, uh, you know, if, if there needs to be any blockage of any alley or any street, which for a plan like this is, is not likely, um, but we'd be working with, you know, Randy and the ANC to put together a construction management plan and frankly, sort of a full list of agreements of how we're going to work together uh, throughout this process. Paul, anything to add on that? Um, only to add, I know that this um, this ANC is familiar um, with, I think, construction management plans that have been successful, um, so the, the Ingleside uh, project recently, and I think that, you know, there was a good experience there. We have something to work with, and I think maybe to just uh, touch on what Marjo said, too, is that we know that we are early in this process. We are coming to the community to talk about and to address as many questions as we can now, and we will continue to do this through the process of filing the application with the BZA, processing the application with the BZA, and then through the construction process as we move forward. Murray is, as we, as Trey mentioned, they, their goal is to be a wonderful long-term neighbor and presence in this community. And it starts, for lack of a better term, it starts now. And I just wanted to add, add that there was a question about the other buildings, ECC is, has those buildings, we are on the five acres behind it. The only building that we will touch is the media center and that face and look will be very much the same except that we'll have access that people visiting the field can use the bathrooms and that kind of thing. But um, the apostle trees are part of the ECC portion of the property and we will be very respectful of that whole side of that which is really not ours to use. Okay, I think I'll stop there because we do want to get questions from the audience. I don't know if any other commissioners have have questions. We can go down the line with commissioners and then let, let me just the... let me suggest, John, what we do here. Commissioners can ask questions, and I would try to limit that to about ten minutes or so, if we can, because I really would. There are now 28, 25 questions in the uh, Q and A, and when we get through the commissioners, I would like to go through those and. Uh, uh, see if we can get answers to all of those. Okay, Chris, are, are, yeah. Chris has his hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment uh, to the, the neighbors of this proposed facility and that uh, just, uh, you know, if the facility doesn't go ahead and somebody else decides to develop something, it could be a lot denser and have a lot more traffic and construction than what Murray is proposing. Uh, they're proposing a beautiful field surrounded by trees. It'll be used part-time for athletics. It'll be shared with the community. I, I think this is a win-win for the community. I, I don't think you can worry about the small amount of traffic that will be developed because other uses could develop a lot more traffic. So just a, just a caution to everybody. Peter? You know, very quickly, I understand we're at the conceptual here and I don't want to press too hard. Uh, there certainly seems to have been uh, some dispute about the balance between uh, Murray use and public use at Jellif. 
Um, uh, uh, two questions. One, uh, would the school consider uh, a neighborhood school uh, uh, committee that would, uh, would work with each other, members working with each other to hit that balance uh, that makes the neighborhood happy and provides for the school. And related to that, um, if this project comes to fulfillment, um, will you uh, forego or reduce your use of Jellif, which is close to my heart because my kids played Stoddard there with the field a mess, um, uh, or, <laughs> Or, uh, or, or, or are you, do you, or do you intend to hold on to that facility too? Well, let me try to answer that, Peter, and um, if any trustee wants to do it. First of all, you know, I think that the bottom line is there are not enough fields for students and kids to use. And that has been a problem throughout the city and my whole time, you know, in the search of a field. That's why we let so many different groups use our field and why we need to have that to be artificially turf so it can actually be usable for multiple people. In terms of the Jella field, as you remember when your kids were on it, it was an unusable field. It was run by the Boys and Girls Club. The city bought it, but asked us to develop it at two and a half million dollars for a 19 year lease with a midway re-upping the lease. We have only used, we only use it about 10% of the time. We've already negotiated with Hardy Middle School, which has expanded over the last 10 to 11 years to use it more. We want to share space as much as possible. Um, in terms of this, it is working not with a city field, but uh, having a long term lease. We don't want to use the field any more than we need to. We're open to working with other organizations like DC Stoddard, if there are local public schools that would be interested in using it during the day, all of that is very much in our wheelhouse of what we're committed to, both at Murray, at Jellif. It's premature to say, you know, what our time at Jellif will be. We have a um, extension until 2029. 20, um, We've added and just redid that field for about $700,000. But we're certainly not going to hold on to anything that isn't necessary. And so if we have this field that is of service to Murray and to others, we will continue to look at ways that we share the fields, any fields we have any attachment with as much as possible. Did that answer your question, Peter? Uh, basically, uh, the question of uh, Let me follow up on that, though, Peter. Uh, the the Jell-O field, as I understand it, has lights. Is that correct, Marjo? Correct. And that was not for us, Randy. That was something that the city asked us to put in, which we paid for. We never used them. Okay. Uh, not... I just want to make, make sure that the commitment not to have lights at the ECC site is long-term and solid and not going to get changed. A hundred percent. We do okay. not need lights. We never use the lights at Jella. That is for other groups to use. That was requested by the city. Just as we've never used the swimming pool we developed at Jella, that's a community pool. So okay. that's all part of trying to be and provide a really great facility down in Georgetown. And that's what we plan to do here, but no lights, not at all. And the reason to have a gate here is to make sure that we close it at night so no one thinks that this is a party field you know in the evening. Michael. Hi. So my, my kids um, played three sports each at Georgetown Day. We competed against um, Murray um, all those years they were in school and some of those games um, drew more than the number of spots that you have available in your parking lot. And so one of the things that I'd be concerned about um, is what your plan is for parking in the community if there is an overage. I mean, there's, there's a whole issue of traffic in the community. Um, 
especially with um, 18 year old drivers and 17 year old drivers that speed through our community um, all the time now. The, the, the notion of having more um, young drivers speeding through our community to get that school to me is a, a bit frightening. Um, but the, the only question I'm asking at the moment is about make what can you do to ensure the community that they will not have those cars parking? Because um, we see it at St. John's. When St. John's has a big game, the parking all along the perimeter of St. John's is completely full. The buses are there, and it's frankly a congested, dangerous mess. So that's my question. Michael, let me answer the question and then ask Liz Hall, who's our director of athletics, who goes to almost all the games to answer it. First of all, Murray's um, athletics is nothing like St. John's, <laughs> not in, in any way. We may have a few games a year, literally a handful of games that bring out a lot of kids, whether or not it be a you know, homecoming game or you know, city rivalry. But typically we do not have a lot of even students there. We are going to bring all of our students um, who are playing on the bus. So they're not kids driving back and forth to the field. They are coming through the field. But Liz, can you speak to the, the size of participants? Well, uh, first let's get, oh, I'm Liz Hall. I'm the athletic director at Murray and this is my 33rd year. Um, I guess my first question was, did Murray beat GDS when your kids were there? <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael. Kidding. kidding. Dude, no, the answer is um, my daughter's soccer team remained um, undefeated um, against Murray and as did our, our, as did the girls basketball team. I think we were competitive in cross country um, and I don't know about, um, uh, lac um, lacrosse. Okay. Just, just checking, wanted to see where we stood. Um, if we have big games, the Murray Sidwell game, the Murray GDS, uh, two of the uh, biggest games, uh, we would be happy to bus kids and ask the other schools to bus their kids to the game. Well, let me follow uh, up on the parking question. Um, <laughs> would it be possible? I mean, parking right now, there's there's parking particularly on the north side of Nebraska, because there are no houses there. Would it be possible to uh, restrict the parking for anyone who's coming to those games or uh, any, any of the practices or anything else, if they're not parking in the parking lot, just parking on that north side of Nebraska and not in front of the houses on the south side? Uh, maybe we could work with DDOT to restrict the parking uh, on the south side to only a residence. I'm not sure whether that's going to be possible, but uh, that would certainly help things, I think. Randy, I think we're more than happy to work with that. I, again, think with bringing our kids through the buses, having 50 parking spaces are going to be pretty um, adequate most of the time, but certainly Paul can put that into the work with DDOT. Yeah, just to add to Marjo's comment, uh, I think, you know, the, the, the city may even say, and I think we're going to, you know, hold our ground that we may have too much parking just because there is so much when the traffic engineer studies the parking in Nebraska, as you said, Randy, on the north side, there is a fair amount of parking that goes unused because the houses across the street have driveways and there are no houses on the ECC side. Uh, but all that to say that we will dig into that further and report back. Uh, but as Marjo said, our preliminary look uh, based on what Liz has shared with us in terms of, you know, the number of folks who come to games is that between the 50 spaces and really the northern part of Nebraska and the busing in of students, kind of those three uh, and, and players, those three together will mitigate the situation in most, if not all circumstances, but certainly Randy will follow up. Thank you very much. Any other commissioners have questions? Um. I'm just curious, I mean, you guys have mentioned a couple times about you believe that the 50 spaces are going to be sufficient. Is there any type of study that you've guys done or do you have exact numbers of how many um, cars are coming to the games? Which ones are more crowded? Do you have anything, um, you know, more than what you 
bank, anything concrete? Certainly. So um, we have provided to our traffic consultants um, attendance, approximate attendance figures that we expect for our different games as well as for practices. Um, with our um, traffic consultant. They've also been working with us on developing um, traffic counts as well as parking counts, specifically the amount of open parking spaces there on Nebraska Avenue. Some of that work has not come fully to fruition yet because the city um, did not allow some methodologies for traffic and parking counts due to the pandemic back in the spring. So we've had to wait until the fall when schools were back in session to really get that work going full bore. But we have engaged them to do a study for us um, to make sure we have adequate parking. Early indications indicate um, that it's going to be sufficient as well as our early conversations with DDOT. So it is- yeah, I might just add to that. Um, I'm sorry, Trey, um, uh, Commissioner Gore, you know, as part of this process, uh, there's a lot of dialogue, not just with the ANC, but with the Office of Planning, with the Department of Transportation. And so well in advance of any sort of public hearing for this application, we will submit the transportation study that you're talking about that talks about the numbers and with the trips. And uh, that will be presented to the community, to DDOT, uh, so that when the uh, Board of Zoning Adjustment reviews the application and looks at the potential impacts of this use, on the community, on the transportation network, on available parking, they'll have all the information they need and more importantly that the ANC needs uh, to answer these questions. Okay. I think Liz, Liz, really Liz, you're not planning on adding a football program, are you? We we actually do have a football team, which oh, we've had since the 1960s. Uh, um, so yes, this never is saw, a, we didn't have it at GDS, so I never saw you there. But there is, um, it's the field would be used for football, soccer, and lacrosse. But also back to your conversation, Lisa, or questions, I, I really do go to multiple games and way before the pandemic, I have, we have a pretty good count on how many kids um, and how many spectators are at the sports. We will look at that very carefully, as well as what Liz said, if it's big games, we can have kids come from schools on buses to that, that place and then not be cluttering the parking lot. But the, the number of games that has a large group other than parents for watching the games are really fairly limited. Okay, Connie, and then I wanna to go to the Q&A if we can. Right, mine is just a very quick follow-up to um, uh, Commissioner Gore's question. Um, you're just talking about Marais teams. What about uh, DC Soccer Club and the DC Dynasty Baseball? The other, the other local teams that are offered access. Uh, do you have a sense of how many people will show and what their needs are and what the, um, you know, what uh, how it's going to affect, I guess, uh, parking spaces and so forth. Connie, I think we would be more than happy to work with um, those groups to make it really clear what is acceptable and what's not. We have DC soccer on our backfield all the time. They don't have a lot of people watching it except for their parents. So again, it's not like, you know, St. John's, which I understand is such a bigger um, element. But when I come to, to our campus on Saturdays, we have the farmer's market, we have DC Saturday almost all the time, and it's parents bringing the kids, picking them up, but it's not even taking most of our parking spaces on the campus. Okay, and my follow-on question to this question is, um, during the presentation, it sounded like uh, the uh, organizations that were offered access or, or ones you've already worked with. Is there a plan to open it up to others maybe that haven't had a relationship with Murray? Absolutely. I mean, we want to be um, thoughtful and helpful in looking at your neighborhood. As, again, if there's some local public schools that could use this space during the day, for example, that would be of real interest. So yes, we want to think about district children being able to use this. We are not looking at adult use of this field. We think it's really important that it be a youth athletic concept. Okay, and then before we go on, Randy, I just wanna ask for process uh, check, which is when we're um, um, stating the question, we keep it on there. And after the answer is, is um, 
is finished, then we say that it's been addressed live because I found that it's really hard for me to follow sometimes which question okay. was just asked. Okay, so, thank you. Commissioner okay. Chang, will, will one of you um, walk us through just so yes. we catch everyone? Yeah. Great. I'm, I'm going through it and I'll try to consolidate those that I can and skip over the ones that have already been uh, answered. The first question was from Peter Lynch, has a decision been made on grass or turf? And it's gonna be turf, we've heard that. Um, Mike Beatty. Can asked, I just, just emphasize that turf has changed hugely and we're happy to give people the dynamics of what that turf looks like. It's not rubber, it's environmentally sound and really will allow for better drainage and everything else. Okay, Mike Beatty asks, what about the use of the field for the neighborhood residents, for instance, exercise or sports when not being used by Murray? Is that going to be permitted? I just see absolutely no reason why not. Um, we're certainly not trying to close it. We want to be respectful of ECC and making sure that it's just the field space that's being used, but we see this as a good neighborhood um, place for people to exercise. Okay, Sandy asks, will the swimming pool be removed? Yes, we do expect that the swimming pool would be removed. It's where the proposed parking area is, I believe, um, but it's also um, not a greatly usable space at this point, I think. And this is a question, I think, for Stephanie Nash. Uh, what are ECC's plans for the remaining building space that is not subject to the lease? Is this space, if this space were to be used for a children's school again, where would the children play outdoors? Thank you for that question. I think that was Jeffrey who answered. Um, we will be continuing to use the buildings uh, that exist for our um, emotionally uh, ED program for students and for their families. Our hope um, is that we would do so after some reconstruction and renovation. Uh, some of that has been posted on our website. So um, staying true to our mission, um, being uh, able to stay in this community has been very important to us, and we anticipate being able to do that with an open in fall 2022, uh, providing all our construction and renovation goes well. In terms of the other portion of the program about a uh, question about outside use, we are still in the planning stages for where and in what other spaces we could have playground type equipment for students. We have quite an indoor facility, but it is important as the, um, I think it was Jeffrey asked that we have spaces outside as well. But Ray has also um, graciously in the agreement, we have uh, some use of the field as well, not on a daily basis, but there will be some use of that field for the um, Episcopal Center students as well. Okay, Jerry Mallets asked uh, that you mentioned the, the width of the multipurpose field is 195 feet. What's the length and how close does it come to the edge of the property? Trey? Sure. So playing surface is going to be 360 feet. Um, it is a tight site for a football playing surface. Um, in terms of how close to the edge of the property, I don't have an exact number for you, but I think as I mentioned earlier, we won't infringe on the current boundaries of the site. So those boundaries remain intact. We would not you know, take any alley space. In some places, it would come fairly close to the current um, fencing that's around the property. But in many places, um, from our initial engineering look, we're gonna be 10, 15 feet away. But in all instances, we're gonna seek to have that landscape buffer um, around the property line. Okay, Daniel asks, what about security? Is the plan to have on-site staff 24-7 how would you control access to the facilities? So we're still thinking about security, um, you know, and kind of what the needs will be. I think you know, this discussion helps inform that for us. Um, we do think there could be a need to have some security. As I mentioned, there's a gate. Um, we've also thought about potential for security cameras um, or a little bit of security lighting. We do, do not want it to be a place where people come after dark park and leave cars. Um, obviously, someone has to be there to close and open a gate. So there will be some in-person presence that we expect to have, but we haven't completely landed on 24-7, eight hours a day, um, what that might be. Okay, Karen Perkins asked some questions about Jellif. I think those have been answered. Um, Kevin Morrison also asked about security off hours, and that's just been answered. Um, 
Um, Daniel asked about other lights uh, around the field. What's the latest the lights would remain on? I don't know whether that would be, for instance, in, in some of the concession areas or other places like that. I'm sure going to have some lights there. What's the latest the lights would remain on? Well, for security lighting, you know, I will say this, because we don't expect to have anything there after, well, we don't have any need to have anything there after dark, we think that there may not even be a need for lights in the parking lot, truthfully. Mm -hmm. um, and so there may not even be a need for lights at nighttime, other than maybe a small security light in some locations. Um, as mentioned earlier, our athletic programs have no need for lighting of the field. So there won't be any, you know, the kind of the large lights that you see um, on athletic fields. We just don't need that for our programming. So we won't have them. And related to that, Levine asks about PA and loudspeaker systems on the field. Are there going to be any PA or loudspeaker systems? Um, so, so we don't use that now and um, we don't expect to have those. Liz, is there anything that you want to say about that? Ray seems to be. Liz, do you want to answer that question? Pray you're going in and out. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, uh, sure. We don't um, have big PA announcements now, and we really don't, uh, we do not plan to do so going forward. Okay. Uh, Susan asks, what about the relocation of mature trees and what does that entail? How many trees will be located? How likely are they to survive? Am I, do I sound okay now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, so what is entailed in moving trees? There is root pruning that needs to happen. Um, there can also be pruning of the trees canopies that need to happen so they can be moved along um, where they need to be. Um, in terms of how many trees will need to be moved, um, we think right now it could be about four trees. Um, we're still back and forth about, you know, can trees remain in place given our plans um, for developing the field. In terms of survivability, we have had initial conversations with um, a company that has a lot of expertise in moving trees and not just any trees, moving the very mature trees that we're talking about. So large, um, what we call heritage trees um, as defined by the district. So there's um, a plan that you have to put together that how you will take care of the trees before they're moved and a plan that you have to take care of those trees for three years after they're moved to ensure their survivability. And so we have to get that plan approved by the city. And so our arborists would work on that plan, put it together, get it approved by the city so that the city says, yes, okay, this is a reasonable plan of action um, for moving this tree and, and having it survive after the move. Well, and as, as we've told the Murray folks, we've had some experience with trying to protects trees in the past and it has not been very successful. Uh, so we'll be looking at those um, plans very carefully as well. Uh, and you, can never, you can never guarantee what's gonna happen with a tree when you move it uh, or when you uh, dig around it, uh, but we'll be looking at that as well. And we're working with the folks who worked on the Fannie Mae site, which was very has been very successful, but we're looking at that carefully as well. Oh, Randy. Okay. Carlos asks, uh, when and how can we expect to get answers to the questions that were submitted? Well, we're going to try to answer all of them live if we can. Uh, and if we don't get to everyone, we'll have the answers on our website uh, and we'll post them there. Um, there's an anonymous question. Would anybody be able to walk in and use the field where the surrounding neighbors have ac access to it? What, the plans do not mention anything on garbage disposal, collection time, pest control, et cetera. Do you have details on these issues? Sure, so I'll, I'll take that. Um, I think we've talked about folks being able to use the, the field um, when it's not in use by others. It will be artificially turfed, so it's probably not a good place for dogs to go to the bathroom. Um, just want to mention that. Um, but again, you know, a parent wants to go you know, throw a ball with their child, you know, that's, that's great. Um, we would welcome that. In terms of um, garbage disposal, disposal and collection time, um, you know, we haven't worked out those details yet. I did mention the service yard. We do expect that maybe that's where we would keep trash. Um, 
and that's where it would be picked up from, from that alley. Um, there's actually an existing connection to a, um, a concrete pad that's there on the ECC, on the ECC site now um, into the alley. So we would utilize that. Um, in terms of pest control, you know, we have pest control contracts at the school. Um, I would imagine for our, um, the field house, which is now the media center, we would do something similar. Um, you know, I'll remind everybody that we would have that media center building in our lease and the other buildings would remain um, under ECC domain. And so, um, you know, we would ensure we do what we do for the part that we're leasing. And I'm sure the ECC does what they need to do for their part. Okay, Cal asks, is the scoreboard on the north end of the property intended to be used to also be used as a baseball scoreboard uh, or will the baseball field not have a scoreboard? Uh, it's intended to be used for both. Okay. Um, has your transportation study looked at the parking on uh, Utah, which has been particularly busy uh, now that uh, the traffic is, is restoring, is coming back after the pandemic? Yeah, so the surrounding streets have all been a part of, um, are going to be a part of that traffic study. Um, and again, that's why the city wanted us to wait and why we think that makes sense as well. So we can get a, a true accurate picture of how busy Utah may be um, and how that would impact our ability to have adequate parking on the site. Um, D. Patton asks, what is your vision for bioretention? The city has gone, just gone through this neighborhood with a well-designed bioretention, bioremediation program. Um, I know you mentioned a little bit about stormwater control. Uh, can you describe that a little bit better? Yeah, we're still early in on that. But as I mentioned, one of the things we know is that there is a lot of runoff on the site now. Um, the bioretention piece, I'm not an engineer personally, so, um, so I don't wanna speak uh, out of turn, but we do want to design something that's going to capture that water and be able to filter that water out before it gets into the drainage system. So we expect to make big improvements on that. So whatever water does run off, we capture, filter, um, so we don't cause additional problems for neighbors or for water systems. Um, I'm sure whatever the city has made available, our engineers will be in tune with as they kind of work on their preliminary plan. Are there any plans for having a, a permeable paver for the parking lot? Yeah, we've talked about that. Um, there's the potential to use a, a permeable surface. Um, you know, I think we wanna make sure we're doing what makes sense for the property and the neighborhood and the trees that will remain in place. So um, a surface that's permeable is, is certainly, um, you know, in play for us. R Randy, yeah. I, I will add Randy, just on, on that note, um, Murray has parking spaces uh, on campus that are permeable. And I believe, Trey, they've worked quite well. So, you know, we have experience with it. You know, environmental stewardship is a big part of the curriculum and the focus of the school. So um, we're going to be digging into that more, but rest assured, we'll look into it. And my, my sense is it will make a lot of sense for the parking spaces in the parking lot. And overall, um, the city does now promote low impact stormwater management, which is sort of, you know, capturing it and treating it before it leaves the site. And so as we design, as Trey said, we're going to ensure that, you know, the site has the best of those techniques uh, in comparison today where there isn't anything. So for the surrounding neighbors and just for the sake of good stewardship, uh, I think it'll be an upgrade. Daniel asked, will the shot clocks mentioned in the presentation have a buzzer sound amplified? They will have a buzzer, um, but um, there's levels that you can set your buzzer and we'll set it on the lowest level. I, I know the neighbors will be concerned about that noise level. Um, okay, Deep Patton asks, the plans indicate a, a retaining wall adjacent to the existing alley on the north. How deep is the excavation expected to be along the alley? Sure. Um... I do not want to speak out of school on the exact numbers, um, so I, I don't want to give an exact number, but what we do know is there is a, a fairly significant elevation change as you move from the northwest corner of the property to the southeast corner. We expect to do some cutting and some filling, so that will re, um, limit the amount of cutting that we need to do in that northwest corner, which is where I think you're, you're talking about that alley 
um, the houses that are on written house. So um, we will, you know, it's not going to be, you know, some massive 25 foot retaining wall, um, if that's maybe what you're imagining and, and worried about, because we will do some cut and fill. As mentioned earlier, you know, we're certainly happy as our plans come together and the specifics to make those available um, for folks to take a look at. Uh, Francesco asks, is there any consideration for some surveillance cameras? Yes, um, and as we as we talk about that, you know, specifically around the um, the media center, which would be the field house, um, we have thought about it there because we will have items that we um, will store there permanently. Okay, um, Becky Madek asks, uh, what other when other groups or organize organizations use the field, will it be fee based? And if so, who gets the fee, Murray or ECC? So uh, it would be fee based. Um, we have a fee based program for um, renting our fields now. Uh, that fee would go to Murray. Um, it would be a, a, a sublease for the dedicated time period. Our agreements um, currently with anyone who leases our fields behind our building have very specific provisions. I think we mentioned earlier that you know, we would work with the neighborhood on provisions that we need to include in our agreements and make those provisions very clear to anyone that wants to, to use the space. Do you have uh, some written agreements that you could share with us for your current fields so, so that we could have an idea of what that would look like? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Randy, Randy, just very quickly to add, you know, those fees, Murray's responsible for building the new fields and then maintaining the new fields and paying ECC as a part of our lease. And so those dollars will use to offset, you know, a small, very small portion of those costs that we'll be investing in the field. So it's, it's uh, my point is it's not at all a profit making endeavor, but it's just to, uh, to help defray some of the fairly significant upfront and ongoing cost uh, for the fields. And as Marjo said, you know, a number of our existing partners and kind of you asked about future partners, lots of folks have raised their hands and said, you know, this is something we'd love to be a part of. One thing I'll note on that is uh, high school kids often have places to play sports because their high schools have larger fields. It's often the younger kiddos who, you know, uh, K through eight, where there's really more of a need for field space because their schools often don't have them, certainly not a, of this size and scale. So I think there'll be a sort of a good niche for those younger kids. And I raised that because, and Stoddard's a great example, because those younger kiddos sports really don't generate certainly not the St. John's level of traffic, but even frankly, the moderate Murray level of traffic, because it's a, a bunch of parents like myself and my two kids, eight and 11, you know, watching soccer on the weekend. So just to give you a little perspective about some, some of the other uses that, uh, that may be considered. Okay, Becky asks about uh, future expectations to increase spectator seating. I think that's been discussed and answered already. Um, Francesco says, from what I gather, there will be no constructions to the current buildings facing Utah. And uh, I don't know, Stephanie, you want, might want to address that. Uh, the uh, building address in Utah, what would be considered the main building that people see with the pillars, I'm believing that's uh, what the question was addressing. That building will remain um, for our programming, as well as the building that's kind of closest to that batting cage area in the parking that would, is facing Nebraska, that building would also continue to be utilized, as well as the one that's facing the other side of Utah, which would be considered building C for us and closest to the alleyway. Um, each of those buildings would still be utilized for ECC programming. Um, there's a question later that I, that I may also need to address about the leasing situation, Randy. So I, I guess I should wait, or do you want me to speak to Go that? Go ahead right now, that'd be fine. Okay. Um, well, no, are, are there, is a later question here? I, I thought I saw you something had, about uh, a leasing situation, but I can wait. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to that then, then okay. just be easier, I think. Um, Mike Batty says, uh, to clarify comments that Marjo made, did you say that you would plan for the fields to be open to neighborhood residents for recreational use when not in use by Murray during weekday and weekend days? I said that we are happy for the neighborhood to use that. Obviously, if there's a DC Stoddard game or DC 
soccer game going on, but there's still field space and neighbors want to be over there tossing balls, that's fine. Um, we're not closing it to the neighborhood. We want it open for people to use for youth sports, whether or not that's individuals or groups. I think you did mention earlier too, Marja, that we, we want to be respectful of ECC and, and you know, their use, right? Um, so, you know, kind of all hours of the day, if ECC is running programming, you know, right. there, there are considerations around that. Thank you. Um, another anonymous question, why was the decision to make the, the fields artificial turf, turf versus natural grass? I, I can answer that and Liz can too. And any of you who've worked with um, fields, um, natural grass will just not hold up. Um, and will not be able to handle that. When my kids, which was eons ago, were playing for Stoddard, they couldn't play half the Saturdays because it was too rainy or too muddy or the fields were um, topped up. So really the only option for athletic fields is to be um, you know, turfed unless you are a huge football university that have five different fields to rotate. Liz, do you want to comment on that at all? Uh, yeah, we worked with a company to look at um, whether or not to put in a, a natural grass field or an artificial turf field when we redid our backfield um, the second time we put in turf. And um, this is a company that really is pushing natural grass. And he said with the amount of use that um, we put on our field, uh, that, that, that the turf was the only answer. Uh, there's not a down season that we can give this field um, to, to grow the grass properly. Hey, Jennifer Anderson asks, uh, how do you connect to the service area that will be developed that was mentioned that was used for emergency access to the fields? How is that area accessed? From the alley? That's right. From the, um, from the alley is how we would propose to do um, that access. There won't be paving that goes from the parking lot um, all the way to that area. Okay, Mary, this question I think has been answered already. Um, Ann Sun has a question, she says, for the ANC, not very many of Murray's students live in this neighborhood. For certain, this will be, cause additional traffic to the, to the neighborhood as parents pick up and drop off kids. How do we plan to mitigate the effects of the commuting in our mostly residential neighborhood? Um, I, I think that's gonna come out of the transportation study and we'll find out then what the level of those, uh, of those trips is going to be. And then we can begin to work with DDOT to put in whatever traffic calming measures or anything else that's necessary. Uh, but Again, we, though, our kids will be coming most often by buses, a bus, and then being brought back. We also do have lots of families who are in and around this neighborhood. We are very pleased that so many kids and families live around um, your ANC. But the, the, it's not going to add in the same way of the, you know, kids who are playing soccer won't be driving their own cars. They'll be coming from the school and back to the school in a bus. It'll be the, no, it'll be the, the spectators that I think is the, is the issue more than the, the players. And Randy, I mean, one of the things that's going to be difficult is if there are a lot of um, spectators coming through the neighborhood, um, Dealing with how Waze routes cars through the neighborhood is going to be the biggest challenge. DDOT not going to be able to control Waze if right. Grants Avenue and military and those are backed up. They're going to send them right down Rittenhouse and Stevenson and on right. the other streets. Um, okay. Um, Ann's question about whether the facility is gated has been answered. Um, Will there be loudspeakers on the field? No, there will not. Okay. Um, Brian asks, uh, would like to know how high the planned landscaping might be along the Rittenhouse Alley and how high the scoreboard will be and its length. Presently, the residents along the alley enjoy an infinite green view from the backs of their homes. I can't speak for my neighbors, but we'd rather continue to have that expansive view rather than looking at, say, bushy junipers that might be might give us privacy. We'd rather have a view, even if it's now the field rather than a grassy field. 
Well, I think, you know, Brian, I think that's a conversation that we want to have with, you know, neighbors on Rittenhouse, neighbors on 28th Street, right, in, in kind of groups to understand, you know, what you all may think is appropriate there. Um, you know, we want to we want to do something that's appropriate. And as I said, we're, we anticipate having additional conversations um, with neighbors, particularly those of you right there on the that are bordering the, the property. Okay, there's a question about the swimming pool again, but I think that's been answered then. Uh, will there be football games on the multi-purpose field? I guess the answer is yes to that, correct? Yes. Okay. But Liz, do you want to say how many football games in the whole year? Uh, generally we play five home games in a year. And we would also look to play them on Friday afternoon at four um, rather than it's Saturday. Okay. Um, That's just a comment that it would be, and it's unfortunate that the space would not be converted to use as a neighborhood park, but that's. Randy, could I add something on that comment? You know, I, we're not gonna run it from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. You know, we don't run rentals from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. on our backfield at the school. They, they literally run from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on the weekends, you know, during this fall time. We have rentals that go until dark. That's about 6 p.m. But we really expect to be, you know, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. usage. I know travel soccer can run that way, but it, it won't run that way on, on this space. Okay, I'm going to skip Michael's uh, comment there. Um, uh, Becky again asks about the parking on Utah and, and suggests uh, correctly, I think, that uh, if we can get something to have. Uh, Parking restricted on, to only the the uh, uh, the side of Utah next to ECC that would be better. Um, on the, it's some form of enforcement, Randy. I mean, the I, restriction is I, there's going to be a lot of coordination with DDOT, but yeah. restriction is fine, but it has to be enforced. Yeah, I understand, and but we can do something at least. We may be able to do something. I don't know. We'll have to talk to DDOT about that. Um, uh, D. Patton says on the topic of parking, what about the youth organization drivers? Uh, I'm assuming that they're concerned about young drivers, which is something I think Mike mentioned earlier. I think, again, just emphasizing something that Akash said that, you know, we see this working with the young kids, DC Stider, we can um, really look at how to minimize that so it's not the fear of 17 and 18 year olds driving fast through the neighborhoods. Okay, I'm gonna skip Jennifer Bacchus's comment there. Um, um, Francisco again says, just when more than one bus gets gets for the games are two buses fitting on the 50 parking spaces. I think you've said that the, the buses are not gonna be in the parking spaces. They're gonna be at the bus laybys. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, Randy. Um, and that's something we discussed with DDOT um, about how to do that um, in a safe way. And, so the and buses Trey, Trey, there will be room for more than one bus though on the laybys is my understanding. To answer the question, Randy, I think right. that's it, you know, at least two and we can kind of look at you know how much space there is to comfortably fit buses, but two two would suffice in almost all instances. Okay, Paul Rosenbaum asks, not surprisingly, about tennis courts. Um, <laughs> at present, uh, he says Moray does not have any tennis courts at present. They rent or, and the use of UDC's five tennis courts for practice and matches. Would Moray consider putting in tennis courts at ECC? We would love to do it. There's not room. Okay. Unless you decide to take away all the parking and then we put them up in the parking, but I don't think there's room for them, but we'd love to do that. Um, uh, an anonymous question. It sounds like Marais thinks the parking will be enough for their games, but for other groups that will be using the fields, do you know that there won't be more than 50 spots needed. Also, I believe there is there are at least two houses on the north side of Nebraska. That's further up 
uh, toward Oregon. Um, again, that's why we're going to run the traffic studies um, with inputs from the you know groups that we expect would be a, a typical user. Um, the 50 spots that are on the property, though, as well as the Nebraska parking, um, you know, we, we will check and make sure that that's going to be sufficient parking. But again, Randy, just to reiterate that we have DC um, Soccer and DC Dynasty and others using our area. They're not taking up, you know, huge amount of parking spaces. They're, you know, coming in, dropping their kids, but you don't have, you know, hundreds of kids at one time on the field. You have kids practicing, but then going. Okay, an anonymous question. Will the fence along Rittenhouse Alley remain during construction? How close to the alley will the netting be once the construction is completed and how high will, be, will the netting be? And third, how high will the scoreboard be? I don't think that was fully answered before. Um, Sure. So I'll I'll take the first two and then I will let Liz talk about the scoreboard. Um, okay. The fence along the Rittenhouse Alley, um, I do, you know, we again, we have not engaged a construction firm at this point. I do think for safety precautions, something needs to be on that Rittenhouse Alley because folks use that. Um, the trash trucks probably use it to pick up the neighbor's trash. Um, so I think the fence would need to be there. Um, in terms of how close to the alley will the netting be um, when construction is completed. Uh, I don't have an exact, um, I don't have an exact, you know, number of feet for you right now. Uh, I think we should continue those conversations to kind of think about what's appropriate. Um, and then in terms of the, how high will the netting be? We want it to be sufficiently high so that balls do not escape the field of play. Um, you know, I don't have a, an exact number for you on that either, but I think what we're trying to prioritize is making sure those balls don't get out, cause any damage, get into the alleyway. Um, and again, you know, working on lands, appropriate landscaping um, to provide the view that the that everyone thinks uh, works. And for the scoreboard, um, we have not uh, purchased or put in the scoreboard. It's, it's way it's premature. Um, but we are not looking at a jumbotron um, or even a huge digital scoreboard. Uh, we're, it will be within size and perspective of the field. Okay, uh, Meredith asks, you've described use by Murray and third parties on Saturdays and Sundays for the majority of the year. Can you describe any intent to limit this use to provide some relief to residents from the sounds like a seven day, what sounds like a seven day a week utilization? Also this frequent use by various sports organizations seems to leave little time for the immediate community neighbors to use the field. Um, sure. So. You're right that Murray third parties could be using it on the weekends. Um, you know, for us, the, the Murray programming is the priority. So that kind of comes first. So, for example, on a Saturday, if we have games um, that are going to run from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., that may be it for the day, right? They're not going to be maybe things in the morning, for example. Um, you know, in terms of relief to residents, I think, again, the continuing conversations with the neighborhood to figure out what is appropriate in terms of density of use is important to us to understand. Um, we want to strike the right balance between making um, the field available for some of these youth sports organizations to use, given the dearth of fields in this part of the city, and striking that balance with um, what the neighborhood feels like. So we think there's a balance to be struck there, and we hope to find that balance, you know, over the coming months and, and year or so as we work that out. Okay, I'm skipping Kathy's comment there. Uh, Michael has a question, some comments, but then a question. Is there any consideration for a bike share station? So there um, have been some discussions with DDOT about a, a bike share station. Um, you know, we're certainly going to have bike racks. Um, we do have a good amount of families that live in this neighborhood, and we will encourage our folks to walk and bike and use that. Um, DDOT has mentioned in our preliminary conversations with them um, bike share, and so that's something we'll certainly take a look at. Okay, uh, Jennifer Bacchus' question is it, really just a comment, so I'm going to skip that one as well. Um, there's a question about how many trees are going to be removed. I think that's been answered. Um, 
and the water runoff and retention that's been answered as well. Um, the patents question, I think this has also been pretty much discussed. I'm interested in the land. We have tremendous rainstorms and artificial turf typically relies on gravel filled reservoir below grade. How will this be sized to avoid excessive discharge to the watershed and the bioretention again? This, will this be landscaped as a rain garden uh, or simply a basin? We don't have those exact specific details yet, um, but we will work those details out with our engineers and again, you know, make plans available for folks to take a look at um, when we have those. We certainly want to make sure we're dealing with water that's running off on the property, uh, make sure that we're building something that's appropriate um, and to help with that. Okay, um, an anonymous question. So is the gate going to be locked during the day or will the field and the parking be open all day? Again, we we're happy to talk to our, the neighbors about that and what people are comfortable with. My expectation is that um, it will be open sort of during the day and then closed, you know, when it's not being used at whatever hour that is. But we don't see this as a gated community. But again, we need to be careful and work with ECC so that people aren't just wandering onto the field and wandering over to the different pieces of property. So that I think is, you know, what makes most sense for the community and our partner in ECC. Roger, I'm glad that you mentioned that because that it does sound like there will be the need for collaboration um, and communication around that. It seems early on, but it is also an important question that we have the opportunity to speak with the community, with the neighbors about that. When school was in session, let's say before 2019, and we had the full use of the field, while we used it some of the time when we weren't, it was not sort of a opportunity where during the school day, there was a lot of walk off and walk in, I guess I should say trafficking onto that space, because at any given time, you know, students were out there and programming, we just need to be careful for security, of course, and safety as well. So I suspect we will have some ongoing collaboration and communication about that. Uh, Jesse asked, will there be restrictions on buses idling on Nebraska? Um, sure. I don't think we expect for buses to come and idle. You know, the Murray is about three miles. Um, our facilities and our bus drivers report into me. And so there's often times where we may have them drop kids off, come back to campus, do more work, and then come pick kids up. So, um, you know, for games, they may come and park, not idle the bus. Um, so, you know, we, we don't, certainly don't want to be idling um, a school bus for, you know, 90 minutes to two hours for a game. Okay. Uh, William, uh, resident on Northampton Street in Murray, has some comments that we'll just skip over. Um, I think that question about the gate and it's locked and how will the community use it during the weekend? Uh, maybe it, that does need to be answered. Uh, if there's a gate and it's locked, how will the community use the, the space on the weekends? The gate is only the parking lot, is that correct? That's right, yeah. So it, it would be a, a gate to prevent cars. Right, okay. Randy, um, can I ask Trey a quick question on the idling question? Sure. Is that, so is that gonna be a policy, Trey? I said, because your, your answer was that you don't want them out there idling. I'm assuming these are diesel buses, right? Or gas powered buses, they're okay. not EV, right? Yeah. That's yeah, correct. so we don't want them out there idling either, but is that going to be a policy that they're prohibited to doing that? Sure. I mean, I, we wouldn't have any problem prohibiting that. So, you know, don't idle the bus for sure. Yep. Okay. I do think that's important for the neighbors that are going to be close to that area. Those bus fumes are, you know, environmentally hazardous. So I would definitely like to see a policy um, on that. Certainly. I'll take a note of that. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Lee Schinniger has some comments uh, about the schools and um, DCPS and why DCPS can't be using the Episcopal school, but we've gone through that quite a lot. Have some post, uh, Michael made a post on the listserv just recently about that. Yeah, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about it yeah. offline. They could just email me and I can walk them through the whole process that Stephanie and I and the chancellor went through. 
Okay, uh, another anonymous uh, question. Um, so you say you don't plan now uh, about some of these things. Is there agreement that you will commit not to install speakers, for instance? And I, I would just suggest that that would be a part of any agreement that we reach with uh, the, with Murray about their application to the BZA uh, that will include things like that. Um, So that we've, we've got something in writing anyway, that there's an agreement. And, and I think that's the same with the, the lights. Um, I right. To right. just be clear what we're doing. And Randy, we, we did, we, I know we've discussed this, but the idea of sort of an agreement that memorializes any of the number of things, whether right. we talk about something to the stormwater management, for example, is another one, right? But to memorialize what we've talked about, because we absolutely intend to, keep our commitments and it's the right thing to do to memorialize them so they're clear. Right. Um, another anonymous question about the, the transfer of the heritage trees. Um, do you have a, do you have, what plans do you have if the transfer of the heritage trees is not successful? Yeah, so the first step in when you're transferring the heritage trees is to ensure that the tree is healthy enough to be moved and so the city has helped us with those determinations. You know, if a tree is, um, for example, not healthy enough to be moved, um, and the city says it wouldn't survive a move, you know, they wouldn't allow you to move it, um, and you'd have to design around it. So we've worked with them through that process. Um, in terms of maintaining the trees, once they are transferred, you do have to have a plan of maintenance for those trees for three years after that to um, help with the survivability of that tree. And then any tree that's in our leased property, we would certainly be responsible for maintaining on an ongoing basis. Uh, Jeffrey asks, has the traffic consultant provided guidance on traffic impacts during the construction phase? And please, could you describe the grading and construction equipment that would be expected to be involved and the expected hours of work time? Um, Akash, I'm going to ask you to help me a little bit about traffic during construction because of your um, experience and we talk a little bit about the grading and construction equipment, but in terms of um, hours of work time, we would certainly comply with um, all the requirements um, for work hours that are required in the district. I, I can't remember what they are off the top of my head, but we would certainly uh, meet those. Yeah, so sure, Trey. And so I, what we do, again, this is something that... Uh, anyone doing a project like this uh, could and should do is have an agreement with the neighborhood. I called it a construction management plan. So that includes what roads can and can't be used for trucks coming in and out. You know, there will be larger trucks uh, that will be coming in and out during construction. And so, uh, for example, my sense is, you know, Nebraska and military are the appropriate roads for trucks to come in on versus, frankly, you know, any of the side streets. And so what often happens is we come to agreement with you. Uh, DDOT is aware of that agreement. Uh, and then the contractors, whomever we hire to build out uh, the field, will be, um, you know, will be uh, notified of those routes. Uh, you know, the, the superintendents police as best they can. DDOT is often helpful if there's a problem, but um, uh, usually that actually works quite well because big trucks don't want to be driving on neighborhood streets, particularly when you have a military and a Nebraska to use like they would likely use in this case. Um, just a time check here. Uh, the questions are proliferating as fast as they can be answered practically. Uh, so there's still quite a few left. Um, I'm still ready to push on for a little longer. Uh, how do the other commissioners feel and the Murray I folks? Think I think we have everyone here. We gotta push forward. I mean, I think we just read them faster, answer, you know, more briefly and just keep going so that everyone feels like they're heard. Okay, Paul and Rosenbaum. Randy, you also have um, one participant that's had their hand raised for a while. Okay, I would like, I would like to get through all of these questions if we can. Uh, and I, I'd ask people to just hold off their questions. Well, I, if we keep up this process though, it could, we could go on all night. <laughs> <laughs> at some point, we're just going to have to but, cut off the but, question. But maybe, Randy, because you've been reading for a while, I think it's nice to break and have someone be elevated if they have their hand raised. I think we should we should uh, switch to them. It's you know, otherwise it gets it, it gets tiring. Okay, 
All right. If you don't uh, mind. Yeah. You want to do that, Lisa? Yeah. Um, so just one person? Yes. Okay. Not elevator. And, and I would, I don't know who this is, but I would ask that, that they be brief and to the point and not duplicative of things that have already been covered. Claudia, you can go ahead now. Claudia, you can talk now. I'm sorry, I, I didn't ask to be a panelist. Um, <laughs> do you want okay. me to? I, I have plenty of things I can ask and say, but it wasn't the intention. Um, I, Claudia, you have had a lot of conversations, I know, with Murray directly one on one. Yes. So that, that I think we probably should spend the time on uh, the Q&A then. Yes. OK. I, I, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, but with, with all due respect, Connie, can we go back to just having Randy or, or one of the commissioners read the questions? I think this yeah, he's elevating stuff is going to be he's, way he's too just, cumbersome. Yeah. And this is... Okay, I just I, think we need to keep reading, Randy. Yeah, I got to find, <laughs> find my place now. Okay. Paul Rosenbaum uh, says that in, in mid-December, it gets dark at 4.30. And without lights on the field, would it, it would be unusable for any neighborhood exercise activities for most of the afternoon and early evening. Any thoughts about lost utility of the space? We just don't think lights are, are appropriate for the field in, in the neighborhood. And there might be, you know, games on Saturday or ne or practice of kids on Saturday or Sunday, but we will still work with the neighborhood on that. Another question about the netting and how high the netting would be. And uh, will there always be a green buffer between the netting and the homeowner's property? Um, you know, I, I hesitate words about always, but that's what we're shooting for. Um, and we don't know exactly how high the netting will be. You're right, I'm, I'm not 100% clear on that yet. But again, we want to make sure that working with our engineers, our coaches say, you know, how high does this netting need to be? And some of that's going to come from when we know exactly how much we need to cut and then fill, then how high from the playing surface up does the netting need to be to prevent those balls from flying out? There could be uh, an additional fence. We, uh, we don't know that yet. Uh, a, a question about the Stoddard use of the, the fields. Uh, how often are there games? How many? games per day, how many per weekend uh, are the fields going to be essentially used all the time? It, we are, you know, I don't want to speak for DC soccer, but we are certainly going to have an agreement with DC soccer or any other, you know, youth sports organization that's in line with the right density of usage um, in consultation with the neighborhood. I think we, you know, we will stick to that. Okay. Commissioner Kishan Puta, who is, uh, represents the Hardy Middle School area, has a question. Uh, you mentioned that you won't hold, off, hold on to the Jellif uh, field if you don't need it. But since so many are so desperate to use that field after school, will you please be more specific? Wouldn't ECC satisfy all of your needs? Would you really need more? Can you relinquish Jellif if or after the ECC field is developed? You know, again, um, I think it's premature to jump to that um, statement and figuring out exactly what we need or don't need. But as I said, we're committed to having as many students and children using fields as absolutely possible. And so we will look at that. We have an agreement till 2029. We are only using that field about 10% of the time. Um, and we'll continue to work with the neighborhoods and um, different organizations to make sure students get use of the field as much as possible. If I could add uh, very quickly, Randy, uh, you know, one of the charges that the, the board has been given is to locate, as Marjo said at the outset, long-term field space for Murray. So to be clear, you know, this is our long-term solution. And as Marjo said, ultimately our view on this is it will give field space back to kids, whether it be at, at Jellif over the long term uh, and use of this field, it just expands mm -hmm. overall field space. And this will be you know, our, our permanent home vis-a-vis -vis fields. 
Okay, just one second, I lost my place when I went looked at the chat. Um, you're, um, at Kathy, you're at Kathy right now at 8.55 p.m. as a homeowner. Uh, right, right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy asks uh, what the, she backs up to the sports complex, complex and she's wondering how the project will impact surrounding home values. I, I'm not a realtor by profession. I'm not, I mean, you know, I don't know. I don't, I wouldn't know the answer to that question. Yeah, I think it would be hard to gauge that. Um, okay, another anonymous question. One would assume the contract contracts with the other entities using the fields could have restrictions that would make it tenable for them, for the neighbors neighborhood in terms of uh, overwhelming parking and other aspects of use. Is there, uh, is there, it, it seems that there is some element of control there. I assume you do have those contracts and you said you would give them, the, give us the ones that you've got for your fields now. Uh, it, do you have some control over how the other uh, users of the field will be uh, impacting the neighborhood? Randy, this is Vadim Mikatin. I can I can take that because I, I worked with Stephanie on creating the contract with the ECC. So not only do we have the contracts with our third party users that within our contract with the ECC, we have really strict limitations on how and what we can do there. And we actually need their approval for a series of different uses. So I think that was taken in mind, you know, 18 months ago when we started this conversation and it was it, it, it got memorialized. Okay, uh, question about the um, the lease. If EC, ECC is ever sold before Murray's lease runs out, what happens to the lease? Does it survive the sale of the property to someone else? Yeah, we have a lease on that property, on that five acre property. If someone else buys the, 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 the property, they will still be subject to the remaining term of the lease with us. Okay, Mary uh, Vadim, just to add on to what you're saying, at this juncture, there's no plans that ECC, in terms of the existing buildings and the disciple trees in that area, that we would be selling, if I'm understanding that uh, question correctly. So in addition, at this point, there is no plans for ECC to sell. We've been here since 1929, and it is our indeed our desire to continue programming um, from now and, and beyond. <laughs> Okay, Meredith uh, says the previous question was not fully answered. Uh, he was asking about, not about the field, but about the use of buildings. Will the buildings be available for Murray's use or only, well, only, or will other groups be using the facilities, be allowed to use the building as well, mm -hmm. the locker rooms and the toilets, et cetera? Right, so the um, restrooms that we would build in the uh, media center, would be available for use when the fields are being used. They would all, only be open then when the fields are being used. Correct. For, for whomever. Um, <laughs> I, we don't expect them to be public, you know, restrooms, but they would be available for those that are there using the ECC field. Right. Just as at Murray, we have access to bathrooms off of our field for those groups that are doing it. They don't have access to the rest of our buildings, but they have access to bathrooms, which is just being a good neighbor so that people have a place to go. Uh, do you anticipate food trucks during games and practices? No. <laughs> no. Okay. Um... Okay, just another comment, anonymous comment. Um, hey, Randy, just because I think it's important, um, uh, you know, you often see like ice, ice cream trucks come, you know, during ball games and what have you. And I just wouldn't want us to say that we would preclude the ice cream truck truck from pulling in the parking lot or what have you. So, um, you know, I, I doubt that it's going to be a regular occurrence, but I'm sure from time to time. Uh, the ice cream man will find his way into the parking lot. Brian asked about the specific ways that neighbors could get in, 
involved in this process and uh, if they've got some specific concerns, uh, when can they expect engagement to begin and how do they get invited to the table? Well, we hope that with this meeting tonight, it's the beginning, although we've had some engagement with the neighbors, we would be happy to work with you as ANC commissioners of what would be helpful. We're also happy to have people reach out directly to Trey or our director of communications and say, the Rittenhouse neighbors would like to have an open house to talk more specifically about the details. So we're open to meeting with anybody that would like to talk more um, at any time. We actually learn a lot and we'll be able to do our planning even better by having those conversations. Is there some specific point of contact that they can reach out to? Yeah, on our website, it says Director of Communications is Carolyn Law. I think she'd be the best person to do that, but also Trey and I are available at all times. So um, we are, emails are on the website as well. And Randy, we can give you, you know, more specifically exactly who to contact, but we can set up something on our website that people could say this group would like to meet and we can coordinate that. So I'd go to the ECC section of our website with the names of Carolyn Law and her email address at this point. Okay, uh, Catherine asks, will the drain management system take into account the hydrology effect downslope toward Rock Creek Park? The hydrology effect there is what's led to the erosion on Bingham Road. Uh, we wouldn't want the drain off, the, off to dump into the neighbor's back neighborhood block downstream of the field. <laughs> Yeah, so our engineers certainly understand the, the natural inclination of the water to flow that direction, particularly because the field's currently sloped that way. So we would certainly be thoughtful about what happens to the water um, and how it's, how it's and the runoff effects for, for sure. Okay, Jan, this is just a comment. Um, there, there's a question about have you considered putting parking underground? We have not um, considered putting parking underground. Um, I, I think that that would be astronomical and we really don't have the funds to try to do that. Okay. Um, how about ANC members going to some array games to see how small the crowds are? Um, I'm sure we'll get some experience there. That's that, that will come. Uh, Okay, we've ad addressed the home values. Um, how will the traffic studies be coordinated with National Park Service as a study, as they study whether to keep Beach Drive open or not? That could have a significant effect on current traffic patterns. I mean, Trey, I can jump in on this. Like, you know, I think as part of the traffic uh, analysis and the and the study that they prepare, they work with DDOT on the scoping memo. And DDOT uh, requires our traffic engineer to make sure that they take into account uh, background traffic, future developments, and things uh, that are occurring in and around the area. And I would envision that that would encompass uh, NPS's uh, studies as well. Uh, Kevin asks, can you elaborate on plans for possible summer camps and programs? There are no current plans. It's just a proposed thought around potential usage um, in the summertime. So, you know, we don't have plans now. That's certainly something, again, we'll engage with the community on. I mean, I know that DC Dynasty, which really serves the city youth, have summer programs and there's a real dearth of baseball diamonds throughout the city. So I think we want to make sure that we allow this field to be really available to the city youth but again, we want to be conscious of what is appropriate for the neighborhood and not. Uh, but we're not, not planning to start us, just to be clear, Moraine's not planning to start a summer camp at ECC with a bunch of um, soccer and baseball camps. It's for um, standing groups that could use this facility. Uh, an anonymous question, can you consider moving the scoreboard so that residents in the alley do not need to stare at the board? 
Uh, we've looked at an, uh, placing the scoreboard in a number of places, um, but because we only want to put one scoreboard up um, so that the baseball and football and soccer and lacrosse can all use the same scoreboard, uh, that's the best place uh, right now for it to be located. Uh, I think this is a facetious question. Can you put up billboards with painted sceneries so that residents on Rittenhouse don't have to look at children playing outside? It might be nice looking at children playing outside. I don't know. Um, I don't know whether this has been fully answered before or not, but Daniel says, what are, what's the projected buffer space length along the Rittenhouse Alley between the fence and the field? And since the fields are going to be open to the public, are you going to post available hours? And what if Stoddard or associated clubs decide to run their tournaments on this field? Who is going to stop them? So I think we did talk about that projected buffer space. You know, I don't have an exact number, but it's going to be enough to have the landscape there. Um, and again, we'll share the plan so folks can see that and you know provide their feedback. Um, in terms of the field, you know, open to the public. I wouldn't deem it open to the public um, in that we were going to have, you know, public hours, right? You know, it's kind of a thing where, you know, maybe if it's a weekend and you see it's not being used, you could go use it. I think we have mentioned that, again, we want to be respectful of the ECC and what they are doing on, you know, with their programming and with students there from a um, security standpoint. Um, and I think we've talked about how we can have um, agreements that we all agree are appropriate with anybody who uses the field, whether that's Stoddard or DC Dynasty, about what kind of use is, is appropriate for the field. Okay, Jerry Mallet says, asks, besides soccer, lacrosse, and football, I assume the baseball field will be used for Murray baseball and softball. Is that correct? They both seem to have six home games each 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 every season, is that right? Our, our softball will still play at Murray's um, softball field, which is on our backfield. So it really is only for um, the boys baseball. Um, we still love having teams and games on our backfield. Um, so that will not be an issue. Okay, the next is just a comment. Um, another comment from Jay Ingram. Um, uh, question about can you uh, tell us what the exact terms of the of a, of the lease are? Uh, the slide said lease up to fifty years. It's a uh, twenty year base lease with the option for three ten year extensions. Okay. Um, and we. Fully plan to use all 50 years of yeah, that. Yeah. The, the extensions that are, are at our option. So we will be optioning to extend the lease. Right. Um, an anonymous attendee again asks, says, suggests, would you suggest uh, having open houses with all houses that border the fields? Um, I think you may have address that previously about getting in touch with uh, Murray if you've got any, if you'd like to have um, a sort of one on one uh, contact with Murray. We would be more than happy to do open houses with the different um, neighborhoods and we know that Nebraska is a different issue from those on Utah so we'll work on a way to kind of do that as effectively and efficiently and would really appreciate any of your good counsel. As you know, you asked us to send flyers out two weeks ago and a week ago. We, we want to have those conversations. Okay, and this is the last question, I think. Um, there are a few more comments, but these, this is the last question. If you restrict parking on Nebraska Avenue, won't this create spectator parking issues for the side streets adjacent to Nebraska Avenue? I think we'll have to look at that in the parking study. You know, if we were to pose that to our traffic consultants and say, hey, you know, can you take a look for us? If we're only going to have parking on the school side of Nebraska and Utah, you know, what does that do to the available parking? You know, we have to look at that uh, as, 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 a, as a piece of it. Okay, uh, that's all the Q&A. Uh, and I think we're going to certainly end it at that. Um, 
Randy, could we add one more thing about the sure. about the scoreboard? Um, you know, because I did see, see there are a few comments here at the end. I did mention that there's going to be um, cut there, so that means we're going to lower the grading in that in that side of the property to meet where it's kind of lower at the south end of the property. So what that means is that the the bottom of the scoreboard will be sitting lower than street level on that alley. So, you know, if you imagine a scoreboard, the the whole thing is not going to be at street level. So I think that will shield some of the view. So I know folks are having comments about seeing a scoreboard. Not as much of that is going to be visible, maybe, as, as folks are imagining. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments from commissioners or from any of the Murray folks, we really appreciate your coming out and speaking with us about this. And it's, it's um, been very enlightening, I think, for, the, for us and for the community. And we are anticipating that this is gonna be an ongoing process. Uh, as you begin to develop your filing with the BZA, uh, we wanna certainly work with you. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, we had a very extensive uh, agreement with Ingleside about the construction, um, about steps they would take during construction. Um, and in that case, we had we'd already resolved most of the design issues, many of which uh, were taken care of even before they reached the BZA. And so I think it's gonna be a similar kind of thing here. If we can reach agreement on these things, it makes the BZA process go much more smoothly. Absolutely. And Randy, we've done, you know, a lot of different building projects at Murray over time in my 28 years. We've really worked with our neighbors in every one of those. The good news about this project, too, is that we want to be respectful of what's going on at ECC, but it's not like there's this narrow window because you're building a project and then having to have the kids back in the school at a certain moment. Um, so we are going to work with you in terms of hours, how to make this as um, small a footprint on the neighborhood as possible. And just to re reiterate, we'll be clear and maybe work with you and John of how to have those open houses sooner rather than later as we get ready to go to the BZA. We really wanted to have this conversation first before going there, um, but we are working hard to get you know, all of the construction and the engineering and everything done appropriately. Connie? Um, first, I'd like to just thank uh, the uh, Murray team for coming. It's a lot of you and you've answered a lot of the questions. So thank you so much. Um, I think what would might be useful is um, a timeline in a way, right? Because you know what you're doing and you gave us a, a, a few of the phases uh, in your presentation, but in terms of engaging the neighborhood, it would be good to know like when um, this open house might be, but also further conversations so that, you know, people always get tense when they don't know. And, and even though you're working hard, they don't really have, you know, a way to like to kind of wait for them, wait for those questions to be addressed in a forum. So that would be really nice to do. Well, you could work with the ANC on that. Guarantee working with you and the best way to do it, who can organize that with us, since I don't know yeah. all of the neighbors, is to have that within the next month, um, between now and the end of October, early November, having those meetings. We won't have all the answers because not right. all of the answers will have been had, um, but we're very anxious to continue these conversations and keep it moving. Paul, did you have anything to add on that? No, I think that's exactly right. And again, um, just as, as Marjorie mentioned in the beginning, and, and I think I traded as well, our schedule anticipates filing the BZA application, answering a lot of in, in our written materials we filed with that initial application, answering questions that we heard this evening with the idea of, for those of you uh, who may know, the BZA schedules public hearings on a rolling basis. So realistically, if we file an application um, in the next few weeks, we're looking at a hearing January or February of 2022. That gives us the opportunity for the dialogue, I think that is necessary. And I think most importantly too, is uh, as Commissioner Speck mentioned, it's a construction management plan. It's conditions of conditions that we can work with, that the community can work with uh, about operational uses of the property. And so we look forward to 
uh, continuing this dialogue, working with our SMD, uh, Commissioner Higgins, um, and uh, with our adjacent neighbors on Rittenhouse and 28th Street in Nebraska to address their concerns. And as I said, this is uh, the beginning of the process and it's gonna feel like a lengthy process, um, but we're hopeful at the end that it will, be, it will result in a process that everyone can be uh, proud of and happy with the result. So and Paul, if everything goes according to plan, what academic year would you hope this field to be operational? Trey? Um, was it? Yeah, that would be September 2023. So two school years from now. Thank you. And Paul, you know, would it be fair to say, so I think the open house idea is a great one because we have a beautiful socially distant place to do it, the, the <laughs> actual the actual field um, or or people's backyards, you know, either or. But let's say there are, you know, some of these open houses to address particular neighbor concerns. Um, I, I would envision another, you know, ANC meeting uh, and sort of that being Connie, the, the, the way this might work is a series of open houses, another ANC meeting and then a BZA hearing. As you said, Paul, you know, January, February, if you had to lay out a schedule between now and then. That makes sense, Paul? Right. Okay, uh, I think that takes care of this topic. And uh, we really, again, as Connie said, we really appreciate all of you being here. Marjo, thank you very much for putting this together. Akash, you've been great as a person to contact throughout this process. And Trey, we appreciate your, your presentation as well. Thank, thank you all, uh, it's been very, very helpful. Thank you and um, we look forward to reading all the comments and trying to absorb the messages so that we can make this um, as useful a meeting as we, possible. We will, we will send you a, a copy of the Q&A just so you'll have it and you'll, you'll be able to see what all the questions were. Thank you. Also, uh, remember that tomorrow, uh, the, the the video will be available on our website, uh, hopefully tomorrow. So, Great. thank you, okay. thank you, thank you, thank really you. appreciate thank you. you. Thank you so much. Okay, back down to the seven of us again. Okay, um, the next item we had on the agenda is a discussion about the ward redistricting based on the 2020 census. And this was basically just to introduce this topic um, because every 10 years, uh, the wards have to be redistricted based on the most recent uh, census. And um, there, the council typically prepares a bill that, uh, uh, defines the boundaries for the, the wards. And that um, there's a subcommittee of the council that is now uh, considering these re redistricting issues. And they're having a hearing on September 29th at 10 a.m. That will be an opportunity for the public to testify on this issue. The only thing that's before the council right now, however, is the, the current boundaries. Uh, they, are, they don't have a proposal for any changes to the boundaries. Uh, there's more information about all of this uh, at the subcommittee's um, website, uh, and anyone who wants to sign up can testify at that um, hearing on the 29th. But the initial analysis that has been done um, indicates that for wards one through five, they currently, in their current configuration, meet the uh, requirement for equally balanced um, populations in each ward. They, they can be within 5%, I think, of the, the average. And all of those one, wards, one through five, already meet that in their current boundaries. The ones that are going to have to be changed are in wards uh, six, seven, and eight. And there probably will have to be some boundary changes there. Um, there the Office of Planning has um, prepared a tool that can be used to uh, uh, sort of test various boundary changes. Uh, I haven't actually tried to use it yet, but uh, that's available on online. Uh, the subcommittee is going to, th this one hearing on the 29th is just the beginning of a process. They're gonna have a hearing in each ward uh, in uh, late September and October. 
And then they will begin to prepare proposals and that bill will be amended to include proposed design changes or boundary changes for the, um, the wards. That will then come to a vote. Uh, the, the plan is that they will have a markup version of that by November uh, of this year. And that the vote will be on December 7th, which is a legislative meeting that will be the first vote and the second vote on December 21st. All of that is to, to, to say that there's still gonna be plenty of opportunity for us to weigh in on this issue of redistricting at, at some point if we decide that that's gonna be useful. Um, I've had discussions with council members, uh, Che and Janice Lewis George, about this issue, both of them have said that they don't think that there's any necessary reason to change the boundaries between wards three and ward four as they affect us in this ANC. Um, and, and from my own standpoint, uh, I've found that the being in two wards has had some advantages and particularly because we were able to uh, use, to call on the, the services of two different uh, ward council members, um, and that also we've been able to build some bridges, I think, to Ward 4 across the park that we probably wouldn't have had if we had just all been in Ward 3, and uh, that would have made it more difficult for us to do things like we did with the Murray, with the Military Road School, and, um, you know, some of the policing issues that we've dealt with, um, and uh, then we've also sponsored ca candidate forums with ANCs on the other side of the park as well. So all of those have been very good things. So uh, right now, I think uh, our best position is just to, to wait and see what happens. And uh, as things develop, we'll, we'll have plenty of opportunities to pass a resolution or to uh, testify at a later hearing um, on uh, the redistricting for the wards. Now, th that's only the beginning though, once the ward boundaries are set, then there will be a task force in each ward to set the ANC boundaries. And then they will also set the SMD boundaries within ANCs. And all of that will take place beginning in February, I think next year. Um, with, and, but all of that has to wait first for the, the ward boundaries to be set. So there's gonna be a lot of redistricting issues that will come up in the next six or eight months, um, but uh, we'll just have to watch what's going on and um, react accordingly. Any questions or comments from other commissioners? Okay. There's a hand raised in the audience, Randy. Oh, okay, I didn't see that. Um, Gary Thompson, yes, can we we can recognize Gary? Hi, Gary. Hi, Gary. We see you dressed up for the for our ANC meeting. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Uh, you answered my question. Um, but I'll just comment that 10 years ago, I had the um, fabulous task of chairing the redistricting uh, task force um, that reset some of the boundaries um, among our SMDs. Um, I dutifully saved all my files. I tried to be as, we tried to be as mathematical as possible, but mm -hmm. when you get there, uh, let me know, because I have a lot of historic files about that. Um, and, um, and I totally agree with what you said about being in wards three and four. It's just fabulous. So thank you. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Well, I, I'm hoping that we can define our SMD boundaries a little bit more succinctly so that we can describe them in our meetings more easily. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether we're going to be able to do that or not. That would be appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would okay. be nice. <laughs> Uh, let's go on to commission business and see if we can get done with this, um, maybe even before 10 o'clock. Um, the first item is with the, is the budget, uh, um, for FY 2022. John, you want to describe that and, um, perhaps make um, a motion for us to adopt it? Um, 
briefly, I will. I sent notices to all the commissioners uh, with the proposed budget. Um, so I'll just briefly uh, mention where we are. Uh, right now, we have a bank balance of $24,772. Uh, that will probably go down a little bit in the next week as we have some additional expenses. However, the budget for the next year, uh, we're uh, we anticipate revenues or uh, resources of $40,000, expenses of $34,000, and a holdover for 2023 of about $6,000. Just some highlights there, we're going to have about $13,000 allocated to personnel. Uh, we're about five or $6,000 for communications, that's Zoom and Verizon. Those are pretty steady costs. And I've allocated, as you all know, uh, additional funds to help us with SAP communications and and any kind of services may we we may uh, we may engage uh, for that uh, for that process. So with that in mind, I would like to offer a motion that we approve the budget as submitted to the commission. Second. Any discussion or questions from the commissioners? Um, Randy, you mentioned something about the the amount of grants that we're going to give. Is that is is that the, the, the amount of money that's in the budget has increased from two thousand, which was what we spent this last year, to five thousand? I think that's correct, isn't it, John? That's right. Yes. Okay, because I saw I saw eight thousand in twenty twenty one, and then for twenty twenty two five thousand. I was we just only, we actually only spent two thousand. That was I for the see. pantry. Yeah. Right. Uh, Randy I see. Said, okay. Yeah. Randy said there are some. Uh, some in the offing, so I think we're, we're, we should be pretty well covered there. Okay, I want to compliment John on doing a really outstanding job with the budget. It, it's very clear and succinct, and uh, uh, I think very conservative and prudent. So I think this is a good, good start for our new fiscal year. Is this okay. when we propose a pay raise for him? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I'll take it. Okay. Uh, okay, all those in favor of adopting the budget? 7-0. Okay, thank you. Okay, in minutes, we're going to postpone that um, because Peter's still working on them. Um, checks, do we have any checks, John? Uh, we have two checks for approval. One is for reimbursement to Commissioner Zeldin for his office expenses of $134.62. We also have a uh, personnel payment to Stephanie Van Pelt for $630 for work from uh, July 1st through uh, the end of September. So I move that we approve those checks. Peter, you have a question? I don't know if this is the appropriate time or after we vote on the check, but I, I mean, I just want to encourage the committee, the subcommittee that's going to talk about uh, uh, office manager that we need to meet or at least I need to know what the next step is in that process so um, I think we all need to know what the next step is right right uh, um, so is there a time this week where we could even if it's on zoom yeah at least yeah I sent out an email I think Connie is working on some things um, with the position description I've reached out to the ANC Twitter community and got some really good feedback also on position description so we had proposed the next step was to, to get together the four of us um, and that would include John and um, start, you know, going over that stuff and developing the PD. So I think our next step is definitely to get together to meet. Okay, Bonnie's gonna be busy until Thursday, I assume, getting mm -hmm. the... Yeah, I think, this... yeah, I think Friday is more realistic for me. But um, in between, uh, can you yeah. guys work that we'll, out. We'll, we'll work we'll, it out. We'll report back it. out. Okay. Yeah. We'll report back fine. out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. those in. Is there a second for the motion to uh, uh, approve the checks? Okay. All those in favor of approving those checks? Seven zero. Okay. Um, the meeting on October twenty fifth. It looks like it's going to be pretty busy. Um, we have report on the small area plan process and the racial and social equity standing committee, a discussion and possible vote on the application for a special exception at 3637 Patterson, uh, which is the uh, 
the field or, or the playground adjacent to Blessed Sacrament. And that's basically just approving what's already there and a continuation of that um, use of that uh, um, playground mm -hmm. field. Uh, then a discussion and possible vote on special application at 3622 Patterson to construct a one story rear porch addition. And then a presentation and discussion on the development of plans for the Lisner Louise Dickerson Hurt home uh, on Western Avenue. That's the uh, affordable housing that's going to be built with the, the Lisner home. Um, and that's contingent on. on uh, they're being ready to make that presentation. They wanted to make a presentation to ANC 3E first before they came to us, which is reasonable. Uh, and then finally, a discussion and possible vote on application to close the paper road at Moreland Place. Uh, I think we may have discussed this previously. There's a, a road that exists on paper uh, in the office of the surveyor, but it really is never going to be built and it runs right next to uh, a house and some other other people's backyards. And so they're basically gonna ask to, they have asked to return that, those, that property on the deeds to the property owners that are uh, affected by it. So uh, that's gonna be a pretty busy meeting, um, but we've got our, our hands full, I think between now and then with all of the uh, Thursday night meetings that we're going to be having for a small area plan. So we've got a busy October, despite the fact that we're not gonna meet on the 11th. Okay, anything else we need to discuss? Lisa? I, um, Connie had her hand up. Oh, Connie. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Okay, so I was just gonna mention that uh, for Chevy Chase Day, we, uh, with our sign-up sheets, I think we got close to 30. And uh, for the farmer's market this past Saturday, we got close to 40. And uh, what I was going to say to Peter is I'm putting it into a spreadsheet and um, and I'm going to do the SMD and I'm going to send it to you so that we can send out a whole announcement. Um, if unless you want to do that, Peter, um, I could give you the photographs so we could talk about it offline. But I just wanted no, to mention that, that the that farmer's too. market was very yeah. good. It was very good yeah. to go. Mailchimp, and you want me to take, you, I'll, I'll send them out if you want me to, but. I need yeah. okay, you guys I'll talk to you, you tomorrow. Guys. Talk to you tomorrow. Okay. Just wanted to let everyone know how many signatures we got, okay. which, you know, the signups that we got, which was good. Okay. Lisa. Yes, I wanted to um, see what the appetite is. I sent an email around regarding the upcoming hearing on Director Lott's confirmation, as well as um, the hearing on the abandoned cars. Now, I think the abandoned cars is fairly simple. We've had some issues with that in our SMD. Um, wanted to kind of see a commission or somebody wanted to take the lead on some type of resolution supporting that proposed legislation. And then, um, you know, I think the discussion on uh, Director Lott's nomination, I think we should have as well. But wanted to kind of see what people thought about that. Okay, that, that hearing is on the 26th, right? Both, yeah. both of those hearings. Yeah. Um, we could we would have to add that to our agenda for the uh, 25th. Then, if we're if we're going to adopt a resolution or prevent, present testimony or anything else, we'd need to do that on the 25th. Uh, look, I'm happy to work with somebody on the abandoned car issue. I raised a, I've had a real problem with an abandoned car in mine. As a, I can't lead on that. I've got way too many things. Well, the the the, um, the the statute that's proposed, I think, is a pretty good one, and it it I think addresses the, some of the problems that we've encountered. First of all, the biggest change it seems to me is that that rather than requiring two of those items to be uh, satisfied in order for it to be an abandoned car, it only requires one, and that will make a big difference. I think. That's so, good. You mean it, 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 it doesn't require it, meaning if they didn't get an inspection sticker, but they got the registration sticker, that's enough to um, remove them from this? What the, the, the items that are. That would be great, actually. It only requires one of the, one of the items to be in violation. 
for it to be an abandoned car rather than two. That's great. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, we, I really think that we should support it in terms yeah. of resolution because we have had those issues here ourselves, but just in other jurisdictions, you know, other jurisdictions, other wards of the city, um, abandoned cars are a major problem and they are a public safety issue. Right. Um, and it takes other commissioners a long time through 311 requests to get those burnt out vehicles. I mean, and they have real, real, you know, big issues with, you know, cars in seriously dilapidated um, condition to get those removed quickly and get them considered abandoned. So as much as we could support that, I think we're some supporting our community and the district as a whole. I'm happy to work with you on that, Lisa. I mean, I, I think that it's important uh, for us to say something, really. We have a few of our own. This, this is a really simple thing, though. We don't need to have you know, five pages of testimony. It could be two pages. I agree. Uh, this yes. is all we want to do is say we're on board. You, yeah. you, could, you could do this in, a, in two paragraphs. Correct. Identify the, the fact that there are abandoned cars and suggest that the current legislation makes it impossible to have them removed. And so we support this, which will allow for their removal. It's all you need to say. We well, need no, we need to say more. We need to say that we are also supporting this because it is a safety and a, it is a public safety issue. Well, that's yeah, the, yeah. that was paragraph. One. Yeah, that was my paragraph one. This is a problem. The problem is needs to be mitigated by change in law. This law change seems to support it. Anyway, I'm happy to review good. anything that anyone writes or I'm happy to write. Okay. Yeah. We'll figure it out. That sounds good. I also want to say that I support Lisa's notion about whether we should say something about Director Lott, acting Director Lott. Uh, you know, Randy, you gave around his cell phone and said he would be amenable to people. I, I've texted him, no reply. I've emailed him, no reply. Amir and I are dealing with a issue for a, a permit to fix a driveway, and it's enough to give you brain damage. And so uh, I think that that's, that's a cultural issue that the the culture of d dot is we're d dot we don't have to care and i think that we should say something about that before this well, guy is confirmed and there there was a distinct difference with jeff marushian and chris pointed this out as well that jeff came out to the i can't count the number of times he came out and met with me on the street with the, the homeowner and you know we discussed all kinds of things so one meeting i had with him early one very cold winter morning, we met for an hour and a half out on the street and froze to death. <laughs> and Jeff was out there the whole time. And, you know, lot, I, we invited him to come to the, the meeting that we held at Chevy, Chevy Chase Parkway and Military Road, and he didn't come. Well, okay. can I suggest that, I, I don't like to give work to anyone, but can you or Chris who have the history of de dealing with the prior director take a stay i'm happy to help i just don't know uh, i don't know uh, the um the history you know the the prior behavior versus the current behavior i know i i only know the current behavior and it's it's not good well chris was right though that, that the guy before jeff was terrible oh he was horrible he was the worst yeah he, he was far worse, far worse than live oh, yeah. he wouldn't even come to our anc meetings he wouldn't yeah. talk to you period no uh, but um, yeah, I, I I can I can draft something. I'll draft okay. something. Yeah, but it's it's beyond. But it's really just it's beyond just just personalities if they come visit. I mean, I think our greatest gripe is that things take super super long to get oh. things done, and it's just it's just not right. You know, as a district, I mean, we pay taxes. People have serious issues. Uh, people are being harmed. And um, and these cases remain. And so, you know, I've asked to have the 311 request from our constituents, along with our own request to be put into some kind of dashboard. We need that. There's no transparency. We can't follow up. It's just difficult. And if when we do follow up mon to monitor the situation, it's just endless. It's endless. Um, just well, it just j gets dragged out for too long. Let me just say so, that this is not a, a director problem. Correct. It it's an agency problem. It's a it's an agency problem. It's a management issue. It's like if the goal from the director from top said, 
any issue cannot be outstanding for longer than X number of days. And that's the that's the high quality standard. Then maybe something will happen. Right now, I you know he did say he made some changes and he's trying to make some things happen, but it is slow. It is slow, and it's not it's it's not it's very frustrating. Michael said it's a cultural problem, though. And yes, it, it, this you're, is not a, going, you're not going to change those long term DDOT employees. You're going to have to fire them all. <laughs> I mean, well, you can put them on a performance improvement plan. I yeah, mean, we've right. all, I mean, I've worked in the federal government. I mean, if things don't happen, then we don't have to argue this now. Yeah, yeah. we don't. We don't, but uh, it's a problem. 10 o'clock. Yeah. I, Lisa. I, have, I have one request also separate from this when Lisa's done. Okay. okay. Let me just say, um, I think, uh, Randy, you're definitely right. Cultural change within an organization takes at least seven years. But Director Lott has a huge responsibility as the incoming director of setting an immediate cultural tone. And his last meeting with us was extremely disappointing. Yeah. Um, and I, I had a bunch of neighbors in my city. And I tell you, 31st Street is the meeting place for everything in the neighborhood out today. Um, talking the sidewalk issue, talking the Chestnut Street issue, and just, you know, the lack of engagement. Um, so I think it's important, and I don't know if the ANC has done this before. I know there are other ANCs that are talking about doing the same thing that we, you know, when when we have someone that's coming up for appointment, I think it's a very opportune time for us to say what our vision, what our expectation is going to be for them. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's yeah. okay for us to say whether they're meeting or not. But, and at the point in time, whether we would, you know, say we agree to confirm you. If we're stuck with, you know, the way his behavior has been for the entirety of his term, that's a problem. Yeah, I think more than opposing his his appointment, though, it's more giving him a heads up and the committee a heads up that this is what we expect. And yes, because yeah, the, the likely this is our experience, and this is what yeah. we expect. Yeah, you know, the experience has been really, really right. not great. Well, except I, I, I would think that you would say not all around, but uh, not great. Yeah, but I think you'd say that unless there are affirmative, you know, there's affirmative testimony at his hearing that he hears this and he intends to do something about it, then we oppose. Well, as a practical matter, it's not going to, he's not going to be. It's not going to matter. No, he's, he's going to be approved. Well, uh, you know, one, one thing, Randy, though, you know, what's that guy's name who used to hold, I don't know if he still does those ANC citywide meetings? Keyshawn. No, no, he's, um, no, no, the other. Oh, yeah, Shander. 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 Well, I wonder whether or not it's worth sort of reaching out, um, Lisa and I talked about reaching out to him and say, if ANCs across the city are having the same issue, which I can't believe they're not, that the ANC as a collective entity issues a statement of you know, sort of concern or disapproval or whatever, however we want to fashion it. I don't think Shander's doing those meetings anymore right now. I haven't seen him lately anyway. Um, I, I talk to Shander all the time, though, so I can ask him about it. Yeah, would you? Yeah. That'd be great. But I do I do want to go back to this dashboard idea. You know, early on in but, like February, I did talk yeah. to our representative. In and I, they, Let's get yeah. it let's end this meeting soon. OK, OK. <laughs> we can Sorry. go on all night. We're not going to go on all night. So, Randy, though, just to confirm, you're going to put do some preliminary on the lot nomination resolution? Yes. yes. Okay. And then we'll we'll try, we'll try add and, you know, whatever, yeah. and come yeah. up with the thing. Okay. Because I, I have one small business matter, which is when we were at the, when we were at the farmer's market, we, we observed that we need a, a sign that fits on a card table. So Connie dr drafted one. I sent it off to a um, a reproduction company, whatever they're they're called, the print, print shop. And I think I'll get a price tomorrow, which I think is about seventy five dollars to print out one of those, you know, sort of lap like the long one we have. And I wanted to say, is that okay if we yeah, authorize? Is fine. Something like, it's something like that. And the other thing we could do if we wanted to is get 
yard sign like things to to put yeah, let's, also. let's have a discussion let's not have that tonight oh, okay <laughs> so can i but do i have authority to to order the well uh, yeah if, if it's 75 dollars, yes something like that it's a hundred it's under a hundred dollars okay. anything you say now he's going to say yes because he wants to get off the call no. <laughs> just keep no. asking <laughs> i'm just kidding uh, peter is it going to take four seconds oh, god no. <laughs> to adjourn i move we adjourn <laughs> okay. good night everyone